Hey guys, this is Frank Yetter, and you're listening to Submission Radio. Hey, this is Rich Franklin. What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lieben. This is Diego Sanchez. Randy Couture. Alice Overing. Hi, this is Stephen Bonner. This is Don Fry. Hey, I'm Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. TJ Dillashaw. And you're listening to Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. You're listening to Submission Radio. Welcome to Submission Radio, episode 151. It's Wednesday, the 7th of March, and we're back, baby. Submission Radio is back. We're back. We were supposed to be back last week, but we're back now, Cast, and it feels uh, it feels so good to be back. It feels very good to be back. Uh, I think people are almost shocked at this point. Like, mm. they're back? I, th- I thought they were dead. They're not dead. This is news to me. Uh, well, we can confirm. We're dead inside. Officially. We're dead inside. But then again, we're always dead inside. Uh, but it, it, it feels good to be back. Thank you guys for all the warm messages and the emails and the DMs asking, where are the boys? When are the boys coming? Why aren't the boys here? When will the boys be here? Uh, today, official. Sorry to leave you guys hanging. We apologize. Uh, I was on the road, traveling, interstate, taking care of some personal business. But we're back now, and it, and it feels really good. We were on uh, the MMA Industry Podcast last week with James Lynch. So that was like a little bit of a cheeky preview, a little bit of submission radio, uh, a, a little taste. And last week, unfortunately, some last-second guest pulled out. We were supposed to come back last week. A couple of people pulled out, so we released the interviews with Israel Adesanya and Sage Northcutt. So if you didn't check those out, check them out. But yes, Mish Radio back and official, and now it feels really good. That's right, Casper. It's great to be back. We've got some spicy, sexy people in the lineup for this big return episode. Yeah, that's right. Michael Chiesa is making his submission radio debut. A guy we've wanted to have on for a long time, and now... It's the perfect time. He's fighting Mm -hmm. Anthony Pettis. That's a big, exciting fight. One of the most exciting fighters in the UFC's lightweight division. And uh, just a fun guy. So we can't wait to have him on. He had a a cheeky, sexy outfit at UFC 222. So there's a lot to discuss there. Uh, Valentina Shevchenko, obviously going to have her on the show. She is all the talk and all the rage at the moment at 125. So there's a lot to discuss there. Randy Couture returning to the program. Of course, we're going to be talking about the Ali Act, Expendables 4, how Conor McGregor fits into this whole Ali Act situation. I'm curious what he thinks about Leslie Smith's effort as far as Project Spearhead goes. And, uh, you know, he's got a gym, he's training Demi Lovato, he's he's a man in Hollywood, so there's a lot to talk to him about. And uh, that's not all, we've got another guest, don't we, Dennis? That's right, the absolute legend from Severe MMA, Sean Sheehan, comes back on the program. It's a return episode, so we have to get the man on, we'll find out what is going on in his life and talk about UFC 222. Conor McGregor, what's going on with Conor McGregor? What's his game plan? What's he going for here? We'll discuss that. GSP, will that fight happen? And of course, Luke Rockhold possibly fighting Michael Bisping next in this trilogy fight. Will it happen? Do we like it? Is this the right fight for Bisping? All that and a bag of chips. A lot of stuff happening at the end of the episode to stick around. Some fun banter with Sean. If you've heard our chats before, you'll know it's the wild, wild west and anything goes down. So it's going to be a lot of fun. There's there's, there's stuff to talk about. And of course, you know, Sean is, is a FIFA champion. So who knows what's going on there. But before we get to that, just a quick reminder to everybody. If you guys saw our coverage from UFC 221 in Perth, we had a great time up there. And thank mm. you so much for your support. And checking out the videos of course for those who haven't really been to our youtube channel the youtube channel is youtube.com forward slash submission radio au if you listen to this podcast uh primarily through you know itunes or TuneIn or stitcher check out the youtube channel at some point there is some exclusive content that goes that way especially stuff like the submission radio technique of the week and other video content that we put out so check that out and also don't forget to follow us on facebook and uh follow us on twitter at submission aus that's facebook.com forward slash submission radio aus Give us a like, shoot us a message. That's, of course, on Twitter and Facebook. We did a thing on Twitter where all the DMs are open, so we don't have to be following you for you to message us. And that was primarily because we love hearing from you guys, your thoughts and what's going on. And uh, all, Because me and Casper both run our social media, and uh, you know sometimes we're busy trying to put the show together. We don't have the time to follow everybody back. We don't know who's following us at all times. So this gives you guys an opportunity to shoot us a message, let us know what you think, and just kind of uh, share your life with us. And also iTunes reviews. James Lynch will love this one. <laughs> if, you have a, if you have a review that you want to leave for us, jump on iTunes, leave us the review. We actually read them ourselves. They help the program, make it up the rankings, and uh, if it's a great review, we'll read it out here on the program. So that gives you guys a chance to sort of come up with something creative. But Casper, without further ado, because this was supposed to happen last week, it didn't happen. Now we're here. It's about to happen. We have our first guest on the line, 
and I believe you're about to introduce them. Our next guest is one of the most exciting lightweights in the stacked UFC roster, taking on Anthony Pettis at the very highly anticipated UFC 223. He has got one of the sweetest mullet and beard combos around, and he's kind enough to join us today for his very first time on the show. He is Michael Chiesa. Michael, welcome to Submission Radio. How are you today, man? Doing well, man. Thank you for having me. Well, we're happy to have you. And now, right off the bat, we saw your amazing outfit at UFC 222. A lot of big brand names, a lot of Nike. Tell us, how did the sweet getup come together? And do you have a name for this band? Well, uh, the shirt came from my girlfriend as a gift from a company called Pop Your Pup. Um, since I'm out here doing my training camp in Vegas, I, uh, I've been missing my dog a lot lately. And so she came out to visit me. She got a shirt made for me with my dog on the front, so I had to wear it to the fights. <laughs> That's and awesome. Then, what's what what what's your what's your dog's name? Nah. Because that's that's actually the main thing that I want to talk about. What's the dog's name or what's the breed? My dog's name is Blue and she's an and she's an Italian Mastiff. Wow, so cute. And I mean the t-shirt looked amazing. We've got a few friends with those t-shirts as well. So it's a pretty clever gift that she came up with for you. And before we talk about your fight, the other big thing of course that we wanted to talk about was we saw you were at WWE's Elimination Chamber event the other week. Tell us, how did you end up going to a pro wrestling event? And are you a fan of pro wrestling? Um, you know, I, I grew up watching pro wrestling as a kid. I think a lot of us have. And, uh, um, I just was out hanging out with DC for the day and DC just was asked me if I want to go to the wrestling match. I said, yeah. And it worked out perfect. I had no idea Rhonda was going to be there. So it was cool to see her do her thing. And she had a good little group there to support her. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that in a second, but we saw obviously DC and Kane, they had some sweet luchador masks, there was other luchador masks, but we were a bit disappointed to see you without one. What's the go, Michael? Where was yours? Especially after you dressed up as Eric Perez this past Halloween, did you forget the mask at home? Um, well, I don't live, I actually don't live here in Vegas, so mm. when they invited me, I was, I, I wasn't well equipped for the occasion, but yeah. best believe if I would have had a little more notice, I would have shown up with a mask. The interesting thing about Elimination Chamber is it's probably one of the more gimmicky uh, pro wrestling events that you could go to. What did you think of the concept of the Elimination Chamber and and the way that it played out? Were you a fan of it? Did it sort of did you know much about it before you saw it? No, I didn't really know much about it, but you know, I, I just enjoyed the experience. Yeah, just I didn't really I didn't really seem gimmicky to me. You know, I wasn't really looking too far through the through the details that made it gimmicky. I was just kind of enjoying the whole experience. You know, it was a uh, it was a cool event to go to, and the team mobile arena was packed, so mm. it, was just a, it was just a good time. And then the big moment, of course, Ronda Rousey came out. What did you think of her spot and how it all came together? Oh, I thought it was awesome, man. It was, it was pretty cool. You know, she had her her, her uh, Joan Jett. That's who her walkout song is, right? Joan Jett. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she had her Joan Jett walkout song, and we all had our Ronda Rousey shirts on. It was cool. We were all there to kind of rally her up and... Uh, yeah, it was just awesome, man. It was a cool thing to kind of be a part of, I guess. Because mm-hmm. we saw you were h- hanging out backstage. There's lots of smiles. You said on Instagram that you were proud of her. What was that moment kind of like for you? And also, what was it like backstage? Did you end up meeting many of the wrestlers? Did you form any sort of uh, relationships or kind of friendships with any of the other wrestlers in the back? Yeah, I just I mainly just went. We just went back to see Ronda, talked to her, and then we took off. Um, you know, I would have loved to meet Kurt Angle or, or Triple H or some of those guys, mm. but I just, you know, I just, I just went back there to see her and went about my way. Sure. I want to run something by you, Michael. Obviously, you know, one of the things that fight fans sort of find curious about Ronda is, you know, the fact that she hasn't spoken about those UFC losses. Obviously, we're not fighters, so we can't relate, but you as a fighter, can you sort of relate to that and understand, you know, why do you think she's treated those losses, I guess, differently to how a lot of fighters typically do? I mean, she's a fierce competitor, dude. She she competed as an Olympian in judo, and and you can't you can't knock the girl for not wanting to talk about her lumps that she took in the octagon. You know what I mean? Um, people don't realize that when you, when you have your shortcomings, when you compete, you know you you live you have to live on that loss until you get a win. You know what I mean? And mm. for her, I can only imagine the position she's in. You know, given that her last two fights against Holly and. Uh, and, and uh, Amanda Nunes, you know, those two losses, those that, that, those have been spread out over a long period of time. That's something that I don't blame her for not wanting to talk about. You know what I mean? People, it, it's unfortunate people, people look at you like you're only as good as your last fight. And people forget the, the, the things that she's done for the sport and the women's division. And, uh, you know, I don't blame her for not wanting to talk about it. Mm-hmm. And I feel kind of guilty for bringing this up, Mike. But, I mean, and on, on the subject of tough losses, your last fight with Kevin Lee, that was filled with controversy. 
And we know it must have been hard for you, but did that do anything in terms of motivation for this fight, in terms of preparation or doing anything differently? And did, did, is it having the same effect that you just mentioned with Ronda Rousey, where you're sort of still kind of living in that last loss, even though it did have controversy? You know? um, I mean, it, it doesn't take, I don't need any extra motivation to, to get prepared for fights. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very highly motivated guy. I work very hard. You know, it's not like it's not like taking a loss is going to make me run an extra mile. I always push myself to limit every camp. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, in this sport, you have to do your best to try to have a short-term memory, and that's what I've been trying to do. You know what I mean? So I'm so you know until before I got booked with Pettis, yeah, I kind of dwelled on the loss a lot. You know, but now that I got a fight books, I don't even think about it anymore. You know what I mean? My my focus is on Anthony Pettis. Kevin Lee's a thing of the past, and. After this win, my career trajectory is going to surpass his, and it'll all be a thing of the past for sure. I guess the hardest part about that was Lee did go on to get that title shot after you. Was was that probably one of the toughest things, the fact that you kind of saw him go on to get that title shot and go on to be in a position that you probably could have been in, if not for a lot of this controversy in the fight and the fight playing out, I suppose, in a different way? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, because I would have beat Kevin. And if I would have beat Ke- when I would have beat Kevin, I would have beat Tony. You know what I mean? I match up great against both guys. Um, you know, so yeah, it was a, it was a bummer to see Kevin go out there and lay an egg against Tony because I, I would have won that fight. So you know, I'm a firm believer in that. Some people might call me crazy, but I think it's just logical, especially in my world. Yeah, no, I, I don't think that's crazy at all. You've actually been doing some training in Vegas at the moment at the uh, UFC Performance Institute. What's that been like? And have you gotten, I guess, the big question is, what is it like training at that Performance Institute? Have you gotten the same quality training as you would at, say, Syndicate or any other high-level MMA gym? You know, my camp back home is phenomenal. You know, I've had great success training back home in Spokane, Washington. You know, it's got me, you know, at the highest I've been ranked as number seven. I've done all my work from home. And uh, there's just been a few instances where I came down to Syndicate when I've been training for lefties because they've had a lot of southpaws down there. And, you know, once the PI, the UFC Performance Institute, came about, um, it was just kind of a no-brainer for me to kind of come down here. And I have my, I have, you know, the staples from my training camp down here with me as we speak you know i'm sitting across the table from sam cecilia austin arnett my head coach rick little mm. so i'm training at the performance institute i'm training at syndicate for my mma stuff and i got my home guys back i got my home guys from spokane down here so i mean really just kind of put it putting everything together in this camp's been phenomenal so far you're gonna be honest with us how are the meals at the performance institute because we're here they're free if you're a fighter and have you taken advantage of, is it kind of like a buffet situation what are we looking at here I mean, it's there's pizza, there's shit food, and there's also good stuff for guys in training camp like myself. So <laughs> we we hear that they they cook pretty much everything to your liking. Are you are you able to sort of take advantage? And do you ever do you ever order you know a whole bunch of chicken breasts, whole bunch of healthy things, and you know give some to everybody else, the coaches, Sam Cecilia, and just order it under your your tab? Uh, no, I just I think we all just kind of take care of our own stuff. Um, but yeah, you know they. They cater to your needs and, and uh, your weight cuts and whatever diets you have going. So it's a it's a good system they have going on down here. And you're, of course, facing the former champion, Anthony Pettis. What was your reaction when you found out you'd be facing him? Were you happy with the matchup? Yeah, I love the matchup. You know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, being a top 10 ranked guy, I've been, you know, I think I deserve to be put on a bigger stage and against big name opponents and, uh, you know, this is one of the guys where it doesn't get any bigger than this. You know what I mean? This guy's a former world champion, former former pound for pound guy. You know, this is a this is the type of fight that I want. And you know, a lot of people kind of counting Anthony out because of his you know his record in his last seven fights. You know, he's two and five in his last seven. But you got to look at the guys that he's fought and look how he fought them. You know what I mean? He he's you know he, the guy doesn't break. You know, he's got a lot of fight in him. He's he's he went he went five rounds with Dos Anjos and. It, it was in the fight the whole time. You know, he had a tough fight against Dustin Poirier. He's fought Max Holloway. He's fought the best of the best. And a lot of people, a lot of these casual fans write him off because he's had losses. But I think the guy's still just legit as fuck. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, so I, so I, I'm not I'm not expecting a slouch. I'm expecting a very motivated Anthony Pettis. I'm expecting that that champion caliber fighter that we've seen in years past. And I'm hoping that's what I get on April on April 7th. Do you think sometimes in some ways that can make him even more dangerous? Because maybe, you know, this version of Anthony Pettis, even though it's been up and down for him, it can kind of put his back against the wall to where he does bring, you know, an even better version of Anthony Pettis. And I guess, I, I don't I'm not, I wonder what that does to a fighter mentally when they know their back's against the cage. Are you sort of expecting that potentially? 
I don't think that he. I don't think he's going to look at it like his back's against the wall. I think he just wants to get back to his title. You know what I mean? Mm. So I don't think that he, I don't think he's looking at it. You know, and who knows? I could be wrong. It's all speculation. You know, what goes on between someone's ears is their own business. But um, you know, I think that he's just. You know, when you when you listen to the guy talk in his interviews or his, his countdown shows or his fights, he's he's always talking about his title, wanting to get his title back. So I think that he's not looking at it like his back's against the wall. He's just looking at trying to get back to being world champion again but unfortunately for him he's gonna go through me and that's just not gonna happen mm. somebody who took issue with you facing Pettis was james vick he claimed that you were off who the cares with who down. cares about james vick <laughs> no nope. next i'll tell you one thing this is the only thing i'm gonna say about james vick i knocked him out in the second round look at our common opponents he sucks that's why he's ranked below me next question <laughs> can i just confirm because he's campaigning that that fight will never happen the the, the interest no, is in there right james can get lost james is not on my level he needs to go somewhere else next question <laughs> all right well i guess just on that pettis fight you know you're obviously going out there to make a statement like you mentioned you want to you want to surpass kevin lee and sort of you know go a lot further you want that title you want to face tony do you kind of feel almost like you because you mentioned some of his losses recently anthony pettis's do you feel like you've sort of got to beat him even more dominantly than some of the previous guys that beat him recently to sort of cement that yeah absolutely that's something that that you know that me and my coaches we've talked about is is uh you know when you get a guy that's you know been up and down you know and you look at dustin poirier i think the the win against pettis really really uh shot him up in terms of the rankings and get, got him close to the title and uh you know you i just kind of do better than the last guy you know what i mean and that's easier said than done you know i'm expecting a really tough fight on april 7th but that's my plan is just to do better than the last guy. And uh, I really, really, really am confident that I can do that. I have, a, you know, I'm, I'm in great shape right now. Everything's clicking. Um, this camp's going good, you know. So, yeah, that that is the plan. You nailed it. You just got to do better than the last guy. And how do you feel about being on the same pay-per-view card as the lightweight title fight between Tony and Khabib? That's perfect. I think it's meant to be. You know what I mean? This is the card that I was meant to be on. You know, you got you got Paul Felder, Ally Quinta. You got me and Pettis, Khabib and Ferguson. You know, you got. I mean, that's that's six of the finest lightweights on the roster. You know mm. what I mean? And uh, so, you know, while while Tony and Khabib are uh, are slugging it out for the title, you know, the, amongst me, Al, Felder, and, and Pettis, you know, we, we're jockeying for position and seeing who can who can have the better finish, who can have the best win that night, and. and uh, you know, jump up in the top five and get closer to the title. I really believe that I go out there and, and do what I believe I'm capable of on April 7th. I think that it's really going to launch me into the top five. And, uh, you know, I'm looking to be number one contender by the end of the year. And and you nailed it. I mean, it's a, it's the, the perfect platform. You'll see 223, very much a showcase of the lightweight division. What did you, th just on that division, what did you think of the UFC's decision to strip McGregor of the belt? And are you sort of relieved to see the division moving along again? Yeah, you know, that's the biggest thing we need is we need movement. Um, you know, we've, we've, the 155-pound division has been logjammed so many times. You know, when Anthony was champion, you know, he, he had had some injuries that had held him out for a while. Um, you know, so the division got jammed up. And then we had some movement, and then Connor won the title, and we're jammed up again. And, you know, you just got to keep the wheels in motion. So, uh, you know, it's just good to see, you know, Connor's, Connor's two-time champion, you know, but – he can't just sit and hold the belt and keep us all waiting. You know, there's a lot of tough guys, uh, you know, jockeying for their position to be number one. And, uh, you know, you can you only have so much time in the sport, so you can't let one guy rob a bunch of us of our opportunities to fight for the belt. Mm -hmm. Is a part of you still a little bit worried that McGregor shows up during the event and sort of holds the division up again, maybe possibly challenging one of the winners of the fight from the, from that pay-per-view? Hey, you, you got to expect that. You got to expect that he's going to fight the winner of that. You know what I mean? So it doesn't, you know what, the way I look at it is by the time I get to fight for the title, I think McGregor will kind of be out of the equation. You know what I mean? I still got to get through Anthony Pettis. I still got probably two more fights before I'm number one contender. And I think in that time span, I think that he'll have, he'll have, he'll have moved on. You know what I mean? I think he'll come back, fight Khabib or Ferguson probably Nate and then he'll be on with himself and I think that by then I think it'll be perfect timing for me to jump in there and be champion so uh, you know I'm not all too worried about that I'm just focused on myself I'm focused on the task at hand can't can't stress too much about the future and what's going on with Connor that's right the Michael Chiesa era is around the corner I'm um, just on 223 just curious for your prediction who do you think wins between Tony and Khabib is there anyone you're sort of leaning towards the finish it's going to be Tony 
But if it's a decision, it's Khabib, and I think it's going to go to a decision. I think Khabib's going to win three to two, split decision, but it's going to be a hard fight. He's going to get lumped up and cut up from the from the top. You know, Tony's dangerous from bottom, so um, he's really going to have to go out there and earn it. You know what I mean? His takedowns are obviously going to be the equalizer in that fight, but, uh, you know, Tony's a different animal from the guard. You know what I mean? So I think that he's going to get kind of busted up from being on top and uh, – but if there's a finish, it's Tony. If there's a decision, which it will be, it's going to be a split decision win for Khabib. Hmm. Well, as we let you go, obviously the most important prediction of all, what's the one for your fight? How do you see yourself beating Anthony Pettis at UFC 223 on April 7th? A shutout. That's what it's going to be is a shutout. That's all I can say. Well, there you go, guys. A shutout coming at UFC 223 from Michael Kies. Obviously, takes on Anthony Pettis on April 7th. That is going to be April 8th here in Australia and New Zealand. Don't forget to follow the man on Twitter and Instagram, at MikeMav22. A lot of fun stuff, a lot of juicy action there. And uh, we really appreciate it. We really appreciate you taking the time, Michael, with us, especially during lunch. We know we're your closest friends, so we feel like we're intruding a little bit, but also like we were there for that lunch. So enjoy the rest of it, and uh, good luck on April 7th. Will do, boys. Thanks for having me, and enjoy a Vegemite sandwich for me. Yeah, absolutely. Next Sunday. <laughs> you can't enjoy one of those, I, Mike. I, I, no I hate way that doing stuff. That. I, I can't <laughs> handle it, dude. I tried it one time, and I thought I was going to die. Well, I'll <laughs> tell you what. If you, we remember you were a guest fighter here in Adelaide a couple of years back. If you ever are again, Vegemite sandwich from the boys for Michael Chiesa. You best believe it. This is Chael Sonnen, and you are listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys. Our next guest is a multiple-time kickboxing and Muay Thai world champion, making her flyweight debut in an absolutely dominating performance at UFC Fight Night 125. She now waits patiently for her next fight. We have her on the line now. On her birthday, Valentina Shevchenko. Welcome to Submission Radio. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm good. Um, uh, feeling great. Uh, already like relaxed after uh, after my fight and ready to start my new training camp at any time. Mm-mm. Now, did we get that right? Is it your birthday today or was it yesterday? Uh, exactly. It's is this my birthday, 7th of March. So here in United States, it's still tomorrow. And I don't know, do you have already 7 or Yeah, six? yeah. Well, we're, we're in the future here. So right <laughs> now, you're sort of celebrating your birthday with us before anybody else. And we have to say a big happy birthday to you because we feel very special. Tell us. Um, what do you what do you have planned for tomorrow in America? What do you how are you guys going to celebrate your birthday? Um, we are like we'll be uh, celebrating with friends, with my family. Like uh, no, I I don't like to uh, something like too big, too crazy this stuff. No, I prefer to spend time time with my family, some cooking, some like dinner, and enjoying time in very relaxed atmosphere and um, preparing maybe some like traditional food from my country, from Kyrgyzstan, and uh, to have like a lot of cakes. Yes. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's it's all yeah. You you'll be competing at featherweight after this birthday, right? After after all the cakes. What do you? Who, who's cooking for your birthday? Because I feel like if it's your birthday, you shouldn't be doing cooking. Are your friends cooking for you? Uh, it's usually my sister. She's cooking for me, and of course I helping her because uh, even in my birthday, I very like to spend time cooking and preparing food. It's like one of my favorite time when mm. I don't. Uh, I'm not preparing for the fight. Yeah, me and Casper, we like to put the food channel on and just watch the food channel. It just like gets us excited for lunch and dinner. Uh, when, when you think back to all of your past birthdays, do you have one birthday that stands out to you as your favorite? And what's sort of the best birthday gift you've ever gotten? Um, every time, like, it, I cannot say that all my birthdays it was something special for, one, for my birthday. But um, when I um, turned 21... I had my birthday in Paris in wow. Eiffel Tower, so we mm-hmm. went to celebrate there. It was like a um, uh, gift from uh, our friend, so we had a trip, uh, my coach, my sister, he, so we went to Paris and celebrate there, and it was one of the most like beautiful uh <laughs> birthday and last year uh, we spent my birthday in Hawaii with uh, my sister and my coach nice. so um, and every time I try to travel 
uh, somewhere and some some place and every time doesn't matter if even if we are like spending the um, staying in the house I try to like uh, to enjoy it it doesn't matter uh, where but the important things to be like uh, around my family and my friends and just uh, um, like uh, just receive good vibes and good energy from them. Yeah, for sure. It's it's who you're with, not where you are. But I, but I think Paris and Hawaii would definitely help. This sounds like great birthdays. We actually saw that your manager, Roger, shout out to him for obviously organizing this. He gave you what looked like a very nice Bowie knife. Uh, tell us a little bit about it and have you had to use it recently to stop any more bank robbers or any, any troublemakers yet? <laughs> no, this is this is very like beautiful gift. It's uh, I very like like uh, culture of arms. Uh, guns, uh, not not only about uh, like self defense or something like this. I very like to see it like a culture because uh, it's like um, human culture. And every time when uh, we we are thinking about people, and every time we had some like uh, guns or knives uh, together with uh, with us, that's why for me it's more not only like a uh, like a. a self-defense or something like this for me it's like a really really art and this like uh, um, any 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 knife any gun they have their own history and this is what i very like and appreciate from uh from from this part Mm -hmm. and i mean the big question is how big is your weapons collection and what would you say are some of your favorite pieces in the collection (laughs) because i see you you guys have some really cool guns obviously there's the bowie knife how big is it and what are some of your favorites uh, I cannot say that it's like the very very big, but we are still working on on it. And um, here in state, I have a few guns. So I have my Glock. I have few guns from Russian, like uh, like uh, Russian Makarov uh, Nagant revolver. So the the pistol. So um, this not only um, not only like. Uh, modern pistol maybe uh, I can say but something that really um for example this russian pistols it's very historical and it's very like popular in russia Th- that's why um uh, we, i always like try to have something that give me not only uh, like a um, beautiful look but also something that uh, fill me with some history mm. yeah i i I, lo- I love the outlook and I love, obviously, your, your appreciation for, you know, the, the, the art side of it. For people listening right now, is there a certain gun or knife that you'd really want to get next or maybe sort of like a, a, a dream weapon, maybe a bazooka or, or a tank? That's like a gun with wheels, basically. <laughs> Um, I never was thinking like like about something that I wanted next. No, I really opened for anything because I uh, there is like in whole world there is so many beautiful guns, so many beautiful knives. So uh, each time when it's difficult to say okay, next will be this one. Mm. And and uh, but every time we love to spend uh, time on show uh, like gun shows and. And of course, if I see something like uh, very interesting and of course, it's like, okay, I want it next. But I also I have recently uh, also it was a gift for uh, from our friend and uh, so it's six hours Scorpion 1911 it's a very mm. beautiful gun and uh, it's like um, uh, the cartridge it's 357 thick so it's uh, something very interesting for me to explore and uh, to see how it's work how it should and how smooth and how uh, what precision how it works so it's every time it's my uh, um, when I not so focused on my training, like MMA training, I spend a lot of time in the shooting range and like to see uh, how it works everything. Mm. I feel like there needs to be a range of Shevchenko uh, guns and knives mm-hmm. that the UFC need to bring out <laughs> if you become champion. And of course, let's talk about that because the best birthday present I feel like right now that we could think of would be a title fight for you. We know you want to fight in, at UFC Chicago. You tweeted out recently. What have you heard back from the UFC thus far? Have you heard anything back on if you do get that title fight in Chicago? Uh, so we are still in uh, conversation uh, conversation with UFC. My manager, he is dealing all this stuff about next fight, about the date and everything like this. But yes, I was thinking about Chicago because uh, I had a very um, 
good memory about Chicago. In 2016, I fought Holy Home there, so it was a very beautiful place for me. I have good memories from there, and also I have a very big community of uh, Kyrgyzstan people there, so I know it uh, it will be uh, like a lot of fans who will come and support me in, the, uh, in Chicago. That's why I was thinking if uh, June 9, it will be great opportunity to have fights there. Mm, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that'd be, uh, you know, a really interesting fight, one that a lot of people would get behind. We know, obviously, Nico had a surgically repaired foot. Have you heard if she'd be ready to fight again, you know, at, at June 9th at UFC Chicago? And if she's not available, well, like, what are, you, what, are you, what are you feeling? Would you be open to fighting somebody else instead? Or, or is it only Nico and the title shot that you're interested in? I heard that she already started to train. So mm-hmm. I, I, I was thinking, like, from now it's about, like, how many months? Three, four months. It's enough time to uh, be in good shape and good preparation. So um, let's see. Let's see. Still, no, like, uh, I didn't hear too much from her. But I hope she will talk soon. And uh, um, hopefully she will accept because I don't see another. I just the uh, my next fight for the title with Nico. Mm. There's been some criticism. Some people don't think Nico really deserves the belt. What do you think of Nico as the flyweight champion? Uh, she fought honestly for this belt, and uh, you see, create this reality. It was like uh, uh, a lot of girls, very talented girls, and she won them all. So she deserves this title because she was fighting and she did everything what uh, she has to do for uh, winning this title. That's why she is champion. But uh, um, yeah, so like you have to move forward you have to defend it and of course uh, um, after the fight in brazil in belém so i am in ranking number one flyweight contender so um, this is no other ch- no other opportunities like fight we are two together me and her that's why it's like obviously it's the next step will be our fight mm. well, what did you think of a fight against roxanne modafferi to win the belt uh, you mean about uh, fight her with Nico Montano? Yeah, yeah, like what, what? Yeah, what do you think about Nico's fight when she fought Roxanne? Ah, uh, it was very entertainment fight, and it was like you know I was looking at it, and they were they were like non stopping fight during five rounds, five yeah. minutes, and uh, of course it's both girls they are like had a lot of experience, uh, more like Roxanne she has like, a lot of experience and martial arts she ha- she has her own style of fighting, and she was trying to do everything best from her to win this title, but Nico at that time she was uh, better. And she uh, she deserves this title because she won it in that fight. And anyway, like uh, like I said, um, it's uh, she won it a few months ago, but she has to move forward and she has to defend it. And like I said, there is no way to to uh, like to be so quiet and don't say nothing. So. Um, I, I, my opinion, if you are a champion, you have to speak with people, you have to respond. Doesn't matter like how you feel right now, even if you are like, uh, you have your like, uh, she has uh, your like injury or something like that. She has to, uh, to talk something and speak because it's um, like, it's not good for a fan uh, just to be so quiet and not saying nothing. I think it's uh, fans really deserve to hear something. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a very interesting take, you know, building your fan base, speaking to fans. It's a very good point. Uh, And a lot of people are a bit critical of the flyweight division because it's new and with that, the talent is still building. But I'm wondering, Valentina, is there anyone in the division that has impressed you lately? Any new people in the division that you've been keeping your eye on? Uh, You know, like I see this flyweight division, it will be more exciting for uh, weight division in UFC. You are very right. It's uh, recently created and every time something new, it's uh, people, they are like, uh, they are uh, every time speaking like one way or another. But um, from like, Everything was starting from something, even when it was not like any woman's fight in UFC and it was first fight, it was like uh, creating the weight class and making their history, making their like uh, stars, something like this. And now we have this very like 
big and very like great opportunity to create our own own history in flightway division and this is very exciting to see how from the beginning how it will develop and i think uh, i will see uh, from not only in usc but also in the, like in Invicta, they have a lot a lot of girls very skillful and very talented and this 125 it's um, i see it's like um um there is like not only few girls in this weight class there is a lot of girls in this weight class it's something like it's not too small like 115 but it's not big like 135 because for 135 it's a lot of girls they are cutting for 150 and um, more girls they are like work uh, in 135 140 and this is very good uh, weight class for them to be 125 that's why i see in the future it will be very dangerous and very like interesting weight division female division yeah, well, that's exactly right. A lot of the, a lot of the um, straw weights and a lot of bantam weights. We're going to see probably a lot of familiar faces at flyweight. Um, just curious, what do you think of Jessica Rose Clark? She's obviously an Aussie. She's won, I think, uh, possibly the most uh, flyweight fights in the UFC at the moment. She's got back-to-back wins. Uh, what do you think of her? Have you been impressed? Uh, with uh, of her fight with Paige Van Zandt, right? Yeah, yeah, Paige Van Zandt and then Beck Rawlings beforehand. Yeah, um, like like I said, that uh, there is like uh, a lot of young young fighters. They are just started their uh, like way in martial arts, and so we can see they transform. And each fight, they will show something different, something more interesting. And uh, of course, like I say, it's uh, every uh, opponent is dangerous because uh, a- a- anyone from them they have their own arms and their own plans for like for the fight um and um, but like like for now um i'm not considering like any other opponent for me just mm-hmm. nico and that's why i'm not uh, i'm trying not to focus me because i i want to focus me on something one to do this thing like as good not not only as good as i can but in the best shape that i can and then i can start to think about um, everything else Mm. i think the reason why we brought up jessica rose clark is because she when we spoke to her about you she obviously said that she she believes you'll beat nico and i think a lot of people sort of have this notion that nico is almost holding the belt for you some a lot of fans kind of see it as nico's the champion because you haven't fought her yet and this, you know, you're sort of the clear best in the division. What do you think of that notion? Did, have you ever thought about it like that? You know, I really appreciate all people, all fans that they are saying things like this. It's like, it's meaning for me a lot. But uh, for me, like a fighter, I know exactly before you like win the fight, your hand will be raised up and you will have the belt on your uh on you so this is nothing matter that's why uh, I I understand exactly what people waiting from me and I from my turn I will do everything like to show very beautiful fight and to show the same that I showed in my previous fight in Belém in Brazil and this is what I want that uh, if they are speaking uh, like people all people speaking like this right now that they are will be feeling the same on my fight and saying the same things after my fight mm. of course uh the, the title fight is what you want in flyweight but if if you do win the title and you do beat nico would you be interested in coming back to bantamweight and possibly rematching amanda nunes if she's still champion to to be a champion in both divisions Oh yes, this is my plan, and this is what I would like to have. And uh, for now, I really like want to have a uh, few fights in uh, flyweight division to do like best things in here. And how I said every time, I'm saying that I have unfinished business with Amanda. And even after the last hour fight, I know exactly that she didn't want this fight, and I'm not lost it. And uh, I would love to fight her again. And and um, just um, to make all things right. Because it's an interesting situation right now. Um, this past weekend, uh, Chris Cyborg got another victory, and it looked like Amanda Nunes was supposed to fight Raquel Pennington at UFC 224, but now it looks like Dana White is thinking of booking her 
Amanda Nunes to fight Chris Cyborg instead. I'm just wondering, as someone that's fought Amanda Nunes and is planning to come back to Bantamweight to win the title, which fight would you rather see? Would you rather see her fight Raquel Pennington or would you rather see her fight Chris Cyborg? Um, you know, it's like from two, dif- if uh, we can see it from two different sides. Um, mm. If uh, we will consider like all feelings of uh, girls in bantamweight class, I think it's very fair to have opportunity to, uh, to Raquel to fight for the title because it's uh, how many um, how many months? It's um, more than a half a year, uh, and she like I think Amanda has to defend her belt too. But uh, it will be fair for uh, Raquel to have this opportunity to fight for the belt. But but from other side. Uh, more people will be more uh, like interesting to see fight uh, Amanda uh, against Chris Cyborg. That's why like um, it will be one of um, interesting fight. But I think it won't happen like from here, maybe four or five months, something like this. So you don't think it'll happen at two twenty four? You think it'll happen a little bit later? I think yes, because um, bo- because like um, both girls, they have to have like the best preparation because uh, they uh, sometimes you can accept like um, just like short notice fight, mm-hmm. but it all depends of opponent. And this time, I think they will they will both of them they will have to have like full full training camp. Mm. And I guess if you're Amanda Nunes, you're going up in weight against someone like Cyborg, who has just been, you know, so dominant. You want the best preparation possible, maybe even put on a bit of size. How do you see that fight going? Do you think Amanda can beat Cyborg, given how, you know, good Cyborg's looked for such a long time? Uh, it will be. I think it will be very interesting fight because Amanda she uh, uh, she proved a lot from her like. Uh, um, Maybe like from if we 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 can see her like two years ago, and um, um, but still I think um, Chris she has more like advantage advantage in front of Amanda, and more it's like size it give uh, like big uh, role in their fights. It's also it's important because um, for example it's. Uh, uh, the same like me, for example, if I, when I fight in 135, uh, I feel me comfortable, I feel me strong, I feel me like great. But uh, uh, anyway, in my preparation, we have to like see my game plan for uh, for the opponent who is like uh, taller than me, heavier than me, and like to see this a little d- uh, detail. And when, for example, I fight in 125, I know exactly that it will be uh, the same size opponent like me, and I can can show uh, like a little bit more skills that I have without having this like um, uh, mentality of some uh, wrong movement can give me like uh, a lot of trouble. Mm. And uh, this is like, I think it's uh, all uh, size is give uh, like, uh, big importance too and this is like a good and bad sides for uh, Chris and for Amanda too and but uh, I think it will be a very interesting fight and more like um, uh, Chris she don't have a lot of uh, now a lot of uh, opponents for her because it's really difficult now to find something to fight her and of course, you're currently chasing the flyweight title, then possibly the bantamweight title. Would you see a situation if you've got both titles that you'll maybe even try to become the first three division champion and maybe even try the featherweight title as well one day in the future? Who knows? Who knows? It's everything possible. You never can say no. And uh, just I do like in my plan, do everything that I want. And I want to uh, like to have more victories as I can. And so uh, I will like go slowly, step by step. And we will see maybe in the nearest future, I hope. And uh, I can I can like have answer for you on this question, too. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I feel like it's it's a little while down the road. I mean, looking at sort of what's ahead of you in the moment, it's exciting times for you. Uh, if if Nico is available and if this fight does go down in Chicago on June 9th, which is what you're hoping, how, how do you see it going, Valentina? How do you think it plays out, you and Nico? 
Uh, it will be the same. I will put everything from me on. I will uh, have the same like hard training that I have for each my fight. And I will uh, just do my uh, what I have to do. I, I And what I have to do, I have to go to the octagon and show all my skills and uh, total domination. And this is what I want. And uh, I will be focused on this fight and nothing else because uh, like it's good like to have... Uh, like um, before or after fight, all this attention. But during the uh, like uh, during these five rounds of five minute fight, you have to think only about what uh, the best you have to bring to win the fight. And this is it. This is all. I know that she will do the same. She will try to do her best. But um, I've been in martial arts since five years, or more than 20 years, and all experience that I have, it will serve for me, and I will do it, I will do it because uh, I was so close in uh, 135 division weight class, and uh, this is like uh, no for me there is no other no no like step back, no just forward. Well, guys, for now, follow her at Bullet Valentina, and don't forget to enter the hashtag Bullet Challenge. Of course, there's a great <laughs> pose you guys can take. Make sure to enter it, jump on, and uh, Valentina might even retweet it. And Valentina, thank you so much for coming onto the program. Have an amazing birthday tomorrow. We feel very privileged to be the first ones to celebrate your birthday with you, and we hope UFC Chicago works out. It'll be an exciting fight. Thanks again for coming on to Submission Radio. Thank you very much. Have a good day, you too. Hey, this is Ariel Hawani, and you're listening to Submission Radio with my two favorite mates, Dennis and Casper. All right, guys, our next guest is an absolute MMA legend. His accomplishments include holding UFC titles in two divisions, being a part of the UFC Hall of Fame. The Wrestling Observer named him the most valuable fighter of the 2000 to 2010 decade. When he's not kicking ass in the ring, he's kicking even more ass on the screen, being a part of the iconic Expendables movie with his buddies Jason Statham, Sylvester Stallone, Terry Crews, and many more. Oh, and did we mention no one can pull off wearing a scarf the way this man can? It's Mm -hmm. a pleasure to welcome Randy Couture back to Submission Radio. Randy, welcome to the program. Thanks. I can't believe it. I forgot my scarf today. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a, like a reminder on Submission Radio. We've, uh, we've missed having you on. We appreciate it. And congratulations are in order because we saw the other day that you confirmed Expendables 4 will begin filming during the summer. So a lot to celebrate there. Tell us, how's it feel to be stepping back in another Expendables movie with uh, you know all your good friends? You must know them pretty well by now. Yeah, I'm actually very excited uh, for a couple of reasons. Obviously, it's a great group of guys to work with and hang around. We have an absolute blast making the films. Uh, this one's being written by, by Sylvester Stallone, so always excited to see uh, what, what he comes up with in the direction we head. Uh, he wrote the first one. Uh, the second and third were, were written by some, some different folks. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what, what Sly comes up with for this one, who we add and, and what direction we're headed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Sly has a history of writing some really good movies, and I think he's got he's probably got a good idea of the story arc and where he wants this one to go, so that's very exciting. Now, the big problem with Expendables 3 was that it got leaked, which affected the box office numbers, and almost kind of led the fourth one to apparently not to be almost made. What did you know about the situation? How badly do you think the leak kind of hurt the movie's performance at the box office? Well, I think it definitely hurt them. Uh, at the box office. It's it's hard for me, obviously, to understand or gauge how much, but to have a theater quality uh, version of your film Mm. three weeks before it hits the theater on on the black market was was pretty significant. Um, It was the first time we've we've done a PG-13 version of uh, an Expendables, uh, but that should have only increased box office numbers mm. not not decreased it so uh i like the third one i think the third one had a lot a lot of heart and soul i think it obviously needed that if it was going to be a pg-13 um i felt good about it but yeah i was it was kind of freaky to to see it get pirated the way it did and i never did hear what happened i, I know they were trying to track down how and where and uh it got leaked and I never heard if they found the culprit or figured out how or where it came from. It's they're always very, very careful with those things when you get pre screenings to so that you know, they want us as actors who are gonna be doing media to be able to see the film in its mm. finished product so we know what we're talking about. And it always you know, certainly raised 
raised a red flag for me. I was like, man, I hope it didn't somehow get hacked from my computer or my stuff. <laughs> but they watermark they they watermark those, so I'm sure they'll be able to track it, figure out how and where it came from, and hopefully, uh, you know, hold somebody accountable for that. Just quickly on this new one, do you know what rating it will be? Is it PG thirteen as well? Or are you guys going back to the old one? I'm not sure. Uh, I have not heard. Obviously probably be able to figure that out within the first couple pages of the script <laughs> but uh the script's not done to my knowledge uh and it'll be interesting to see which direction they decide to go and and uh i know that uh sly originally wanted to stay with the r rating mm. and, and there was some debate in the second film whether or not we were going to be r-rated or pg-13 i know that uh chuck norris was pushing uh, to see it be P- PG-13, just because of his his beliefs, uh, his beliefs, and uh, it ended up being R. Um, and then for three, they changed to the PG-13. They felt like they were missing a lot of ticket sales because a lot of kids were buying a ticket to another film and sneaking in to see the Expendables. So heroes. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it always comes down to dollars and cents. Mm. Uh, Sly's writing this one. I know he's fond of the of the R uh, versions of the film. Um, so we'll you know, we'll see what he comes up with, and I'll I'll, I'll trust him. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the R rating. Like, obviously, a lot of Stallone's R rated movies are really good, and you know, Deadpool had a lot of success with the R rating. So I'm curious to see. But of course, you know, the the whole crew looks to be back. All of the guys look like a lot of fun. A lot of guys, a lot of histories. I imagine there's so many stories. What are some of your favorite moments? Sort of hanging out with them in between or after shooting. Any classic stories or or, or funny things that stand out to you? You know, after all these years of shooting with them. Well, you know, we. Uh Rolled on a set in Barna for Expendables 3. Very first day of shooting, we're supposed to shoot a a, a scene of coming down an alleyway with, a, with a, a Jeep with a 50 cal on the back of it shooting at us. And we're on a big technical kind of a flatbed truck. I don't know if you've heard this story before, but uh, we all roll in. We're all, all geared up, ready to go. And they show, the stunt guys show us what we're supposed to do and we come tearing down the alleyway on this truck and we're supposed to screech to a, to a halt and then all bail out of the truck and run over and get in a boat to, to flee, to get away. Mm-hmm. And so Jason in his wisdom is like, man, I've never driven that truck. You want me to drive that truck? I, I want to practice it at least once, see how it drives. So he gets in the truck and he back, they back it, you know, back down the alley and he comes tearing up just like he's supposed to when, when the camera's rolling and, and when it goes to, you know, come to a screeching halt, and the brakes go out in the truck and Jason goes right off the pier <laughs> and into the water. Whoa. Uh, we're all standing there. We're all standing there watching. And, and here he goes. He goes right over two cameramen and a camera and, and into the water. All of them go <laughs> in this truck. And we're all just standing there with our mouths wide open. Like, did that really just happen? <laughs> and of course, Sly pulls out his iPhone and starts filming and you know, we had rescue divers there and very quickly Jason pops up and the two cameramen pop up and, and nobody is injured. Everybody's wet. They, they've lost about an $80,000 camera into the, into the water. Wow. Uh, but, but nobody was injured. Uh, certainly not the way you want to start off the, the, the first day of the film, but, uh, it was funny. Jason thankfully wasn't injured. He was wet. He just had to go get changed and, uh, we got a new truck with brakes that work um, <laughs> for the actual film. But it was pretty funny. It was funny to see Sly right on top of it, pulling out his iPhone to kind of uh, catch all the chaos. Uh, but it, it was one of those moments. I love it. Sly just ready with a phone. I'm just, I've always <laughs> wondered this as well, Randy, what's the deal with Jason and his knife skills? I know his character is really good with throwing knives. Is he actually decent at it or is this more of a, sort of post-production thing that they add? I actually, I wonder. Uh, I suspect that that there's probably a little bit of movie magic there, and, and Jason's just such amazing at what he does that you you, you start to think that uh, maybe he has some real knife-throwing skills, and he certainly uh, puts the work in and makes it look real good, doesn't he? 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And Jason Statham is just a, a lethal weapon and one of the favorites down here at Submission Radio. Um, but a bit more on you. You know, we also saw that you've got a new gym in Los Angeles, California. It's called Unbreakable Performance. It's more of a sort of high-end, smaller gym. A lot of amazing people are training out there. People like Wiz Khalifa, Demi Lovato, the Jonas Brothers. We actually saw a video of you training with Demi. What's it like to train with her? Because she, uh, she's obviously been, you know, she used to be with Luke Rockhold. She's been into MMA for uh, quite a long time. What's it like training with her? She's great. Uh, she works her butt off. Uh, she, she's really one of our gangsters there at Unbreakable. She comes <laughs> in, she does a lot of gi training, and she loves to spar. Uh, she still teases me about kicking her in the head one of the first times we worked out. But uh, Really? You did that? We, we, uh, we really enjoy her. Well, I was wearing shin guards, and I didn't kick her that hard, but she, <laughs> did she deserve she it a little bit? Was she running her mouth, her in the head. Pull, pulling a bit of a Demi Diaz? I, I know she kicked me in the head if I gave her the chance. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but she, yeah, she does. She does a great job. She's a very hard worker, and and uh, we're proud of her. Uh, she's come a long way. I think she's got her her uh, blue belt in jujitsu now, and uh, she she's doing great things. Is she that well? She's just, she's officially better than us. Um, is she looking to compete? Is is this kind of a fitness thing for her, or is she looking to do some comps at some point? Oh, uh, well, it's definitely a fitness thing. But you know how it is. The gym is kind of becomes it becomes your sanctuary. Mm. The rest of the world kind of goes away when you're there sweating, and certainly when you've got somebody standing across from you that might punch you in the face, you don't have time to think about anything else. So, uh, I think the gym is certainly her sanctuary something that keeps her you know keeps her on track and, and keeps her moving in, in a positive direction mm-hmm. of course the other big thing that we want to talk to you about is the ali act we spoke to you back in november about the last time when you spoke to the u.s house of representatives i'm just wondering randy where's it at now it seems like there really hasn't been many much news as of late we spoke again uh to congress to the full committee this time it was very well received we have 65 signatures in support of the amendment with Congress. I think we're very close to getting a vote with Congress. Um, once we get a vote with Congress uh, and it's approved there by the Energy and Commerce Commission, we'll, we'll go to the House and and uh, it'll go to, to vote with the senators. And, and so that will be the next step. We're waiting on the vote now with Congress and then, uh, and then we start talking to senators and getting approved in the Senate. Um, that's probably gonna be a little bit bigger challenge. Um, the senators can be a little more elusive and a little more difficult to deal with. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful and optimistic. I think that uh, the lobbying efforts that the UFC has put forth can, can maybe slow us down, but I don't think they can prevent us from, from getting the Ali Act amended. It's just too obvious to everybody that we speak to that it needs to happen. Yeah, what, what did you think of um, Leslie Smith's recent efforts? You know, she's launched Project Spearhead, and she's kind of, it's kind of crazy because she's kind of gone out and done this on her own. Not not really on her own. Obviously, Lucas Middlebrook is, is uh, you know, a big part of her. But she's sort of trying to do something a little bit different. And she's, you know, still part of the UFC, which is something that also makes this, I guess, more interesting. What do you think of her recent efforts? And have, have you had any contact with her? Have you spoken to her at all? I've had no, I've had no contact with Leslie since she's launched uh, Spearhead. Uh, she obviously got a lot of her information from being part of the MMA FA. And she's always kind of, uh, in some ways, uh, created a division and been a bit divisive, um, which is why she's not part of the MMA FA anymore. Uh, I, I think the unionization effort uh, is the wrong model. Uh, it only takes care of fighters th- that are part of the UFC. It doesn't change the sport. It doesn't eliminate uh, the balance or, or affect the balance of power for fighters in their ability to negotiate. I know if they get recognized in, as employees and are able to get a collective bargaining agreement with the UFC, then that might help the UFC fighters a little bit. But even then, it still leaves all the power of the sanctioning and the promoting in the hands of one person, the UFC. So I think it's short-sighted. I think it's a bit selfish, honestly. Uh, I don't think she's considering fighters across the board and all the promotions in the entire sport. The the union model doesn't doesn't fit, in my opinion. And I think that uh, if it does anything, it solidifies uh, the monopoly position that the UFC has. It weakens the class action that that some of the fighters have filed against the UFC, 
And all of those are problems for fighters. I think the more direct and, and quicker way to change the sport for the positive for all fighters is to get the Ollie Act amended. And I think the MMA is really the only ones that are pushing and spearheading that as, as the option. The class action may change the sport down the road, but as you know, class actions take a long time. Uh, and, and who knows how a judge is going to rule. And, and, you know, right now they're still getting, trying to get the class certified, which I think is going to happen in, in fairly short order. But again, it could be a couple of years before we see any change, before you get a ruling on the class action lawsuit. And, and obviously a ruling uh, would, would go against the UFC and, and their business practices, which are being called into question. The uh, being, being recognized as employees of the UFC, which, which is a stretch because we're all independent contractors. Mm. So we get 1099, we sign a contract that makes us an independent contractor. I don't know why you'd want to be an employee. I mean, if you, you can make too much noise or you do what Leslie's doing, you're just being fired uh, by your employer. So it, do, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But, uh, you know, I, I would have frankly rather had all of us fighters united under one moniker pursuing the Ali Act Amendment and the transparency that we all need in our sport and, and not giving the UFC any more position or power in the sport than they have already. Mm. A lot of interesting points that you mentioned there. I'm just wondering because I think one of the things that has sort of been mentioned, you know, around, you know, Leslie's efforts and just recently in general is, I guess, um, you know, some of the things the fighters have to do during fight week. Obviously, media is one of them, uh, maybe one of the more bearable things. But obviously, there's the fact that fighters have to wear Reebok. And if they don't fulfill certain things like wearing Reebok throughout fight week, then they may not get their Reebok money, which is no longer even called Reebok money. So I guess that's a lot of things where fighters see themselves as, I guess, being treated like employees. Would the, I, I imagine the Ali Act wouldn't necessarily help in that sense. Obviously, it would help in other ways. But it, do you see a way where fighters could combat something like that where, with, with all these extra things that they have to adhere to, even though they're only contractors and not really employees? Yeah, I think that the transparency in the sport uh, and, and having a bigger say in the bargaining power and negotiating a better contract, a better deal, a bigger percentage of the money that comes in from the fights you fight on, not having to sign away your ancillary rights and these very uh, exclusive, tight contracts that they're forced to sign now, all that would change if we're protected by the federal legislation that's in place and protects boxers. There's a reason why Floyd Mayweather makes $400 million every time he fights, because he's able to represent himself, get a fair deal, get the sponsors that he wants and, and do the things that he wants to get, get a bigger piece of, of the, of the pie of the show that he competes on. Uh, and that's because he enjoys the protections of the all all the act. We in MMA don't have that luxury. So, we are forced if we want to be ranked and fight for one of their titles, we have to sign a contract and give away a whole bunch of things, which is bargaining power and negotiating position uh, in order to be, to be part of that promotion. And, and that's where the flaw and, and the system is right now. And I think it's interesting that you mentioned Floyd Mayweather. We all saw the money that Conor McGregor made by having the boxing match with him. And now McGregor is kind of one of the only fighters in that position of power where it looks like the UFC would sort of consider anything to have him come back, even maybe co-promotion and stuff like that. I was wondering, has anybody from, you know, from your group tried to reach out to McGregor? Do you think getting him on your side could be a big, big benefit because he holds so much power currently in this MMA world? Because you think this Ali act passing would be, you know, possibly the best thing that could happen for him. He could be making double, triple, quadruple what he's going to be making in the UFC if he comes back. Well, I, I mean, obviously he, he helped us. He, he's a poster child for why we need the amendment uh, for mixed martial arts. It'll be interesting to see if he comes back to MMA. There's been a lot of rumors and a lot of talk. If he, you know, He's been stripped of both his titles. Is he going to come back and fight again? What's going to happen? Who's he going to fight? And the big question, what's he going to get paid? After just getting paid $100 million for a boxing match, even though it was just an exhibition and not for a title, uh, what's he going to get paid the next time that he comes back and fights in MMA under the UFC moniker? Uh, you know, he's, why would he expect to get paid any less than he got for boxing? And you, I can guarantee you they are not going to give him that kind of money. Uh, so again, why? What's the difference? Where, where, where's the flaw here? 
And it's all these things that I've been talking about with regard to why we need to be protected by the federal legislation. There needs to be transparency in our sport. The, the, the exclusive contracts need to be eliminated. Uh, we shouldn't be coerced into, into giving away all these things in order to be ranked and fight for a title. Uh, I should be able to know how much money is made off of any show that I fight in. Uh, so I can negotiate for my, my, my share of that, my, my portion of that. Certainly, as if I'm Conor McGregor, he probably feels like he deserves a bigger piece than certainly 15% of it or 17% of it is he's the guy putting butts in seats and, and having people sell pay-per-views. So all those things are brought into question by what Conor's done so far. Uh, we would love, obviously, to have him involved and, and testify or be involved in pushing the Ali Act through. Uh, I, he's aware of us, uh, but so far he's he's been very – focused on his own deal and, and doing his own deal. So it'd be interesting to see how that shakes out for him. Mm. A lot of interesting stuff there. Randy, just quickly, before we let you go, I want to cover one thing, and that's, of course, uh, the heavyweight division. Uh, it used to be your division, the division that you ruled for a long time. Of course, there's a big super fight at the moment, Daniel Cormier versus Stipe Mircic. But just wondering, you know, what do you make of, obviously, the, the state of the heavyweight division and the current champion in Stipe? Well, I like Stipe. Uh, I like watching him fight. I think he's got a great fighter IQ. He, he shows he's savvy. He's smart. He tries to keep fights where he, where he knows he has the best chance to win. And the, the Gano fight was a perfect example of that. Mm. He showed he showed that he's you know he's durable, uh, and he's a smart fighter. I, I think he's he's going to be tough to deal with. Obviously, I'm friends with Daniel Cormier. We both wrestled at Oklahoma State. He's a cowboy at heart and. Uh, I have a tendency to root for, for my wrestling buddies. So, uh, you know, I, I think if he can get to Stipe and make Stipe wrestle him every chance he gets, he's got a great shot uh, of making it a tough night for Stipe. But he's definitely got his work cut out for him in that fight. Do you think that Stipe can wrestle with Cormier? Because obviously we've seen Stipe being extremely effective with his wrestling. But, I mean, Daniel Cormier is an Olympian. How, how do you see the wrestling playing out between them? Well, I think Daniel's wrestling is, is better than Stipe's, but Stipe's is very effective. Mm. You're looking at a, a long, uh, effective striker. Uh, if he can use his wrestling to make Daniel stand in front of him or keep bringing him back up and, and putting him in front of him, he's got a chance of, of, of making it a tough night for Daniel. And if Daniel can find a way to get inside and, and pummel and, and wrestle against the fence and put him down and, on the ground and make him wrestle off of his back, every chance he gets, then, then he's got a, a great chance of making it a tough night for Stipe. But it's one of those fights that you want to see uh, because they're so well matched up and so it's so interesting. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, Stipe has had an incredible run thus far as, as the champion. Do you think if he gets a few more wins and beats guys like DC, do you think his name goes into the discussion as one of the best sort of champions and heavyweights of all time? Uh, I think he's up there for sure. I mean, I don't know what that criteria looks like or, or, or how you figure that out. But I think you'd probably be he, up there he, as well, Randy. <laughs> he's, he's been he's been defending it for a while now. He's he's kind of been the name for for what is it two years now? I think he's he's just you know it's such a volatile sport. There's so many ways to win or lose, especially when guys are as big as these guys are. Uh, I mean, it takes one shot, and uh, so I mean, he's he's done a great job. All right. Well, Randy, we appreciate the time. As we let you go, final question, we promise. Uh, obviously, want to quickly remind people about another big movie coming out soon. It's not all just The Expendables. There's obviously The Row. It's a thriller. You play Detective Cole, and uh, it looks good. What can you tell us about your movie role in this one? I had a lot of fun doing this movie. Uh, as a, a young cast, um, I kind of play the old guy in the movie. I, I play a dad who's also a detective dropping his daughter off at college and, and mm. then some dead bodies start turning up. And so I got to wear a couple of hats and, and it was fun, you know, having a daughter that, uh, that, that came through those college years and that kind of uh, strife and, and conflict, if you will, between a, a dad and his, and his kid. I think all that stuff was fun to play and portray in this film. And I feel like I, I, I learned some new skills, got some new things done in, in trying to find ways to be a genuine actor. Well, it's going to be very exciting. Everybody can check that out. And, guys, if you're in Vegas, of course, uh, look out for Randy Couture. He's all over the place. But if you're in L.A., the new gym, it's called Unbreakable Performance. Make sure to check it out because we hear a lot of great things. And, of course, the everybody in Australia and New Zealand needs to check that out. And Expendables for whoa. 
All really excited for that as well. Make sure to follow Randy on Twitter at Randy underscore Couture and Instagram at XC Natch. Randy, thank you so much for coming on. We're so excited to check out the race, so excited for Expendables, and we're really excited to see what happens with this Muhammad Ali legislation. Hopefully everything goes through, and thank you so much for taking the time to come on the program. Thank you again. You bet. Thank you guys for having me on. appreciate it. Hey, this is Tony Okagui Ferguson, and you guys are listening to Submission Radio. Keep tuning in, guys. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to have this man in our return episode of Submission Radio. We brought out the red carpet. We brought out the white limousine. He is known as the Sheehan Man. <laughs> you know him from his amazing work on Severe MMA, Sherdog. Of course, he plays FIFA. And although he's not a champion, he's still number two in our hearts. <laughs> Sean Sheehan, welcome to Submission Radio. It's great to have you back on the program. No guests pull out today. I was a little bit worried about you, but hey, you decided to jump on anyway. Yeah, I did offer to come in for an hour and a half to do the whole podcast with you, but you know, it, it was a bit maybe a bit late in the day. Uh, I think it would have actually been a better podcast just because you know, who, what guests are you going to get that are better than me talking mm. for an hour and a half? Let's let's be honest here. And that actually, on, uh, there's an update as well on the FIFA. There was there was a bit of a discussion going on myself and Danny Segura, so there's going to be an update on that FIFA. I, I believe it's been brought over to PS4. Oh. And myself and Danny Segura are going to be getting it on in the big rematch that everyone wanted to see. So that's going to be happening. Soon. Is this a hometown advantage for you, PS4? Because I feel like before it was Xbox, was that maybe not native to you? Yeah, that's a hundred percent. I'm going to absolutely destroy him wow. on, on the Xbox. You know, we, we we talked about it on here. I wasn't that confident on the Xbox. You know, it's not, I'm not making an excuse. He won fair and square, <laughs> uh, even though I, I I really was was still way better than him. But on the PS4, he's absolutely no chance. I'd be surprised if I won by anything less than four or five nil, to be honest. And of course, New York Rick, one of the thriftiest guys in the game. Will he be banned from ringside when this fight goes down? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm okay with having him there. You know, Danny's not going to need all the help he can get on the PS4. So look, if it's actually Danny, hopefully he'll have a he'll have a microphone and, and earphones this time. So we'll, we'll mm. actually know it's him and not a professional FIFA player like last time. <laughs> of course, and also people comparing New York Rick to the Paul Heyman of uh, mm. MMA FIFA yeah. championships. Any comments on that? God, I don't know. He's, he's more like Paul Bearer now, I think, the way he got done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, awesome. And on, on that note, Sean, we have some stuff to discuss from this past weekend in this crazy world of MMA. Of course, talking about UFC 222 to kick things off with and then talking about a little bit of Conor McGregor, a little bit of Luke Rockhold versus Michael Bisping and everything in between. First thing I want to talk to you about is Andre Olovsky versus Stefan Struve. Olovsky was able to get a win here, which uh, comes really for the man. He's had a lot of losses back to back, a lot of tough losses back to back. Do you think there was an op- this was an opportunity miss for Olovsky to possibly hang up the gloves off a win in sort of a more sort of positive situation, Sean? Yeah, I, I was, but we see that a lot in MMA. You know, nobody ever retires in MMA. What, 39 years of age, he's still a young gun in that, in that heavyweight division <laughs> at the moment. Mm. Yeah, Ar- Arlovsky is one of those guys, though, that, that comes back from losses like this all the time. You know, he, when he went out of the UFC first, what was he? I think he lost four in a row uh, when he went to strike, or not when he went out of the UFC first, but when he went to strike force. And it, it lo- you know, in affliction as well. It looked like his career was over. But he bounced back then, you know, in, he had a great time in World Series of Fighting. And I think he had a, you know, a couple of fights around the world as well that he came back. And they need a few, you know, people. What was it? Maybe two years ago, we're talking about him maybe getting a UFC title shot again, and then he yeah. went on that on that five fight skate, and now he's back two in a row. So, you know, Arlovsky probably for some fighters is probably bad to do that to show that they can go on a losing streak and then go back on a winning streak again because they think <laughs> they can keep doing it. And you know, he's won two in a row, so maybe maybe he can do it again. But yeah, it would have been a nice time to see him hang him up, hang them up, but uh, I don't think it's realistic. I almost think, like, it'll almost be a shame to see him hang it up given the performance that he put on. I mean, I guess the thing with Stefan Struve is he may not necessarily be a number one contender, but like they mentioned during the broadcast, for Alhowski to have more takedowns in that fight than his entire career previously just goes to show how much, I guess, willing he is to change things and learn. And, like, we've interviewed Alhowski. We don't know him personally. He comes across as, you know, maybe, maybe would be a stubborn guy. You know, he's got that Eastern European <laughs> thing going on. You know, he's, he's, he's Belarusian where, where the men are hard and, and, and the women are even harder. So uh, for him to change things up for after, you know, doing this and having a lot of success in his career for so long, I think that's impressive. And so I don't, I would almost be disappointed to see him hang it up after this, you know, Arlovsky, what is it? Version 6.0, 7.0 now. What did you think, Dennis? Mm. 
it, Sambo, Sambo Arlovsky. I like it. I yeah. mean, a lot of people forget about the fact that he does have a lot of takedowns, but I think Arlovsky he, he forgot about a Sambo and he, he remembered it in that fight. I think he remembered it a little bit about, you know, he's, he's a little bit like me when I go down in a role with, okay, so what I do is I wait. So I do some Brazilian jiu-jitsu here and there, but I'm very selective and I wait for the <laughs> women and children to have their first classes and then I'll go down there and that's when I remember all of my lethal chokes, the can <laughs> opener, of course, and things like that. So he's a little bit like me in those situations. But what do you think about Stefan Struve, Sean? Because this is a guy that I remember when he first came in, everybody spoke about the fact that this guy is the future of the division, but we know that this height is probably more of a hindrance to him than an advantage. I mean, he cannot use his length to save his life and the fact that people could just move it on him and start teeing away, the fact that he's so tall and easy for easy to take down, and also the fact that he's had problems with anxiety, you know, heart problems in the past. What do you think his future holds? Do you think he sticks around for much longer? Yeah, he will be around a long time just because the heavyweight division is so bad, but he is... Awful, Stefan Struve. Just uh, he's one of the one of those fighters that he has lots of God-given gifts. Well, what, what, uh, just n- nature-given gifts, we'll say, and he doesn't use them at all. You know, you're you're seven feet tall and you can't jab. You can't lose your use your length. You can't keep a guy like Andrei Arlovsky, Ar- Arlovsky, who's thirty-nine years of age, away from you and stop getting the takedowns with that with such a length advantage. Like it, it's absolutely it's crazy and. Oh God, I I don't know. It, like, and, he, think... and he's been in the camps. He's been in the camps, mm-hmm. and he's had a lot of experience. I mean, and that's the problem. You wonder is is it a lack of self? I mean, is, is, does he have a lack of self belief? Is it a lack of, or is this just the wrong sport? Is he, you know, should he be in basketball or something? Is he in there because of the fact that he's got those God given talents? But it's just not sticking. It seems like he's been working with a lot of the best coaches in the world for many many years now. Yeah, some guys just just don't have it. Like, and uh, it's it's hard to say that in him because he's what is he for, nearly forty fights deep now and won almost thirty of them. So, you know, he he's a good fighter. But when you're looking at the top of the heavyweight division, and uh, you know, Arlovsky's not not towards the top now. Although you know, there isn't many towards the top, so I suppose he is. But Stefan Struve just is never going to make it there. Like, it's funny to think that Stefan Struve beat Steve Miocic. A few years back, like it's it's amazing to think that, but uh, God, he's just he's very frustrating to watch. It's it's not that, you know, he obviously can't use his size and his his strength well at all, but it's just that it, it it's nothing seems to click with him. As you said, he's one of those guys that's never really improved. Never, you know, if you think we put on put into a good camp, I think he's trained with Henry Hoofter. He has in the past anyway. Mm-hmm. Like he know he he know he can teach you how to use your lint. He can teach you to fight long like that. But he just he just doesn't. And it, maybe he can't pick it up. Maybe he just doesn't doesn't have the enthusiasm to pick it up. Maybe he's taking a little bit too much damage and can't spar and can't work on stuff as much as he'd like to and and has just uh, stagnated as a fighter so maybe that's it but he's never going to make it to the top I think that's a big shame because I remember back in the day he brought us so many great moments and one thing that he, he does have that a lot that I guess you can't really teach is heart he's got a lot of heart he's he's got a lot of um, I guess will to win it just doesn't really come together for him so it, it is a bit of a shame to see a guy like that not really be able to utilize those gifts but that is the MMA game. Uh, the other thing is, I guess, UFC 222 brought us a lot of new stars. We had Mackenzie Dern. We had Sean O'Malley. We had Ketlin Vieira. So, obviously, Brian Ortega. There was a lot of youth. But we got to kick things off with Sean O'Malley. I mean, O'Malley, Irish background. Sean, you're the mm. perfect man to speak about this. What did you think of his performance? And not only the way that he won, but the fact that he dealt with... And it's... Well, I don't know if I'd say an insane injury, but clearly it hurt him a lot. As you could see by the end of the fight, I think one of the the most amazing things about it was that he, you see him get injured. He 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 gives a little bit of a tell, but not really a lot. He guts it out for the better part of one or two minutes, and then as soon as the fight is over, you just see an outpour of emotion all across his face. He's yelling, he's screaming. It was almost like when Anderson Silva broke his leg and he was yelling. So you could just see like how much he was hurting for those last couple of minutes of that fight, and he still gutted it out. That's a lot of heart from this guy. What did you think of his win, Sean? Yeah, he's following the fo- in the footsteps of other great Irish uh, fighters by winning fights on one leg, you know, and it's... Yeah. <laughs> it, it was a great performance from me. This like, was his Holloway a, fight, like with McGregor, It was, right? it was. Andre Sukumtat and Max Holloway, hopefully for him. Yeah. Anyway, he might be. <laughs> but, uh, and yeah, Sukumtat will come impressive. back and become the champion in the future, right? 
Yeah, he will, yeah, and he'll start calling for Wendy's uh, yeah. <laughs> sponsorships and stuff after Sean O'Malley gets to Burger King. But, uh, yeah, look, o- O'Malley was very good. I'm very impressed with him, uh, especially that last fight after that. I picked Sukun Tat to win because of maybe not, you know, I was wrong to pick him, obviously, because O'Malley won and his fight IQ in the end of that fight was very, very bad. He should have won the fight in the end because of the injury. But O'Malley, to show he can go through fights like that is huge because he, he has the talent and he... He is someone who looks like he's going to improve and he has improved from his last couple of fights that I watched coming into the fight and he's obviously on the contender series as well. Looks looks a top, top talent, to be honest. And, uh, you know, anyone who has watched him will know that, but knows as well that he's not there yet. Uh, he... You know, he's he a lot of people are comparing him to McGregor and he's he is like McGregor, but an early McGregor. You know, he's he's not as comfortable in there as someone like McGregor is yet or Ortega. I know we'll talk about him later. Looks really comfortable in there. He doesn't look that comfortable. He just but he still throws everything. And that's huge as well, because to, to have the, you know, the balls and the ability to come out and throw your shots like that open like he does when when it's tough you know when the going gets tough and he's still throwing his shots that's huge you know the way he fights as well cardio is going to be a huge issue because you you can't simply throw as much as he does and with, with such ferocity uh, but that's something that that's going to be very interesting like with Sean O'Malley uh, he's a kind of guy you know a lot of, lots of guys you you might come in and say I, you know, I can't wait to see their next fight what happens O'Malley's the kind of guy I can't wait to see five six fights of his in a row to, to mm. kind of to put to put down kind of a library of what he's like and the improvements he's making and you know t- to really assess him as a fighter. I think he's one of those guys. But what, from what I've seen yet, very impressed. And of course, the post fight interview on the ground with Joe Rogan, a definite highlight for his career. But just quickly, I mean, it's difficult to say. But as Thomas the Tank Engine goes through, are we jumping on the hype train or not? <laughs> At this point, I want to see a little bit more from him. I want to see one or two fights, then I'll be more comfortable. I was definitely more impressed by Conor McGregor, but I definitely, you know, I can see this guy striking is unbelievable. It looks like he's got a lot of skill. For me, I'm not boarding the train yet. Sean, are you boarding the train? Or are you going to wait around on the platform a little bit longer? I I, I hate the, the the hype train phrase because, like, why why shouldn't we hype up Sean O'Malley? Why shouldn't we get uh, excited about him? Our because Brian hearts get broken, right? Sean. Damn. But I don't care. It's, it's, it's better I to have been lost than never I, to have loved at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm like, so I'm, sick of looking I, stupid in this I really industry. I can't. I can't yeah. look stupid anymore. <laughs> I do it every week. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm so do we. So do we. No difference. Oh my God. I, Stefan Struve will go on and win the UFC heavyweight championship now, just because. Of, <laughs> and then he'll come on our show and we'll be like, "Stefan, your career has been remarkable." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really is, yeah. But uh, like, uh, well, uh, uh, a guy like him coming in. If you're not excited about him, you're just a hater. Like you have to get excited about these guys. Okay, if he, uh, as I said there, I want to see his next five fights. So I'm, you know, obviously holding back a bit. If he doesn't, are you boarding it or not? Don't sugarcoat it, Sean. We want an answer. Listen, there's Team Sheehan is out there, and he's not on Team <laughs> Sheehan. So no. Oh. If you want a simple answer, I'm giving an answer. Not yet. All right. Well, Dennis, you, I, 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 have you have you boarded the train? I'm getting a sausage roll. I'm getting some sauce. You know, I'm I'm trying to put some coins in the machine. Maybe get a hot coffee. So I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the train to roll around. Maybe in one <laughs> or two fights. But maybe around that time, I'll lie and show a fake boarding stub and say I've been on it the whole time. Yeah, bit of an MMA. <laughs> I think I think that's exactly my plan. Thing thing that I'm excited about Sean O'Malley is uh, he's kind of this enigma. Kind of like kind of like Conor McGregor in the sense that he doesn't say any more that he needs to. He sort of speaks in these short bursts, kind of gives a couple of sound bites, and then he moves on and he leaves you wanting more, like a like a good movie or a good woman. And uh, that's that's the kind of thing I like about him, you know. <laughs> he's got his he's got his custom strand of marijuana. He dresses like Hyde from that '70s show at the uh, at the media day. You know, he's got all these crazy colorful tattoos. It's like, who is this man? I, I don't know, but this I find you. what's that. He looks like this costume. He looks like... Oh, yes! Yes! For his next media day, he needs the platform shoes with the um, mm. with the goldfish Dead in fish. there. Someone's yeah. got to be like, Disco Sean, your fish are dead. And then he's like, oh, man. <laughs> but, you know, like, I, I, I like this guy. And uh, I think the UFC, don't fuck this up, you know, because they, they throw these prospects to the wolves... Next thing you know, he'll be he'll be facing someone in the top two, and they'll be trying to get him a title shot. So I think the lesson here is with Sean O'Malley, give him very small, incrementally better opponents, and give him these small tests that he can pass, and then uh, and then we'll see. You know, don't don't feed him through the wolves yet. But mm. broken broken foot could be a blessing in disguise for him if he has one. 
right. you know, put him out there for a few months. You know, let him let him kind of recalibrate himself, bring him back slowly. And but then if he's healthy, he milk it, so. stay on the sidelines, keep improving, and then you know a little bit of extra improvements. You get him to walk around with some crutches on the sidelines of a fight night and be like, mm-hmm. "Wow, this guy's a champion for just being here." And Take then, a, and then UFC 223, have him in the crowd, and then he throws the crutches off, jumps the cage. It'll be like, be like a pro Steel wrestling chair. event. Yep, still do chair. a bit of a Ken Shamrock. Luke Rock holds next to him, trying to throw up a gang sign, still trying to figure <laughs> out. <laughs> what did you? But I will say that I will, I will say that his opponent had a great nickname, the Asian, Asian Sensation. Yeah. But I feel like there's a lot of Asian sensations out there that feel robbed. Like we can only have one. Can you have multiple Asian sensations? Can you have Asian Sensation 2.0? I think it, it like he he's basically taken up a whole whole culture's worth of sensations mm, with one yeah. nickname. It's he's like different. pitbulls, pitbulls in uh, Brazil. There's just everyone's a pitbull. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everyone, everyone's silver. Every yeah. but let's talk and everyone, yeah, everyone's an ex UFC champion. Let's talk about Brian Ortega because he did send Frankie Edgar into the abyss. There was a moment there when Frankie Edgar went backwards, and it was like he was going through the dark universe. That that. Da, 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 da. song kind of went through your head as he was flying backwards it was an unbelievable sight i mean frankie edgar an unbelievable warrior and of course jumping on twitter and you know putting out a really good statement uh conor mcgregor was really big on him as well i think everybody is i mean he is a fighter's fighter but sean what did you think of ortega's performance i thought it was absolutely phenomenal brilliant performance my analysis beforehand i, I kind of picked out the big area for this fight was the in-between bit so uh, you know i think ortega's a, a better striker than he's given credit for and i talked about that in my video last week and i think he's obviously we all know about his jiu-jitsu his ground game is really good but it's the in-between bits you know whether it's the wrestling whether you know frank Edgar pivots really well moves between shots, kind of circles around you. And that's where Ortega struggled beforehand. It's just, you know, I thought he'd have big problems stopping uh, Frank Edgar, getting around him, pivoting around him, moving out. But he, he, he did so well in those areas. His jab was on point. He kicked to the legs and body. He was throwing hooks around, using his size advantage against Frank Edgar, you know. When, when that fight started, I didn't realize how much bigger Ortega was than him. You know, and mm. I, it was it was mm. huge to see. And, you know, we talk about Stefan Struve, who can't throw a jab to save his life. Brian Ortega used his size brilliantly. Just, you know, it, we, we don't see it a lot in MMA. And, uh, you know, Mike Perry last week, awful, you know, doing it as well. And Ovan St. Pru, all the time I speak about him and his jab is awful. But Brian Ortega used it very, very well. And it's it, going forward for Brian Ortega. The, amu- the amount of improvement he showed between his last couple of fights and this fight was huge. And he's, you know, he's still young in the sport, what, 14? 0-1-1 I think uh, our 14 0 one one no contest he still has a lot of improvements to do and to, 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 you know what he did against Frank Yeager was brilliant and it's I, I spoke earlier about being calm in the octagon he is so calm for mm. someone still so young in the sport and he puts a wildness with the cam as well because he needs to because that's where he wins fights with the big knockouts big submissions and changing things up that's how he did it with Frank Yeager you know faking the elbow throwing the uppercut then coming with the elbow again hurting Frank Yeager and then knocking him out with the last few shots with you know obviously the big uppercut being the big one couldn't be more impressive Brian Ortega Got to talk about Frankie Edgar in a second, I guess, just what's next in store for him after this loss. The first stoppage loss of his career ever, which is just insane. Mm-hmm. And the fact that Brian Ortega, you know, for a guy who we didn't really, you know, I guess everybody underestimated his striking to do it in one round and to do it so devastatingly. That's, that's the kind of knockout you expect in the heavyweight division, much less at featherweight, is just insane. But obviously you're talking up Ortega right now. Early days, but who are you favoring between him and Max Holloway? You'd, you'd have to favor Holloway, to be honest, but I wouldn't rule Ortega out for a second. You know, as, as I mentioned, those big moments, he can get those big moments against Max Holloway. He can take him down, get a submission. He can land a big elbow like that again when he mixes things up. When a guy goes for it as much as he does with his level of skill, it's very tough. But I have to pick Max Holloway. I just, I, I think if... Ortega goes for him. Holloway will come back and he'll bite down his mouthpiece and he'll mouthpiece and he'll fight and he hits harder. And he, you know, Art, or, uh, Holloway is no shrinking violet. He's yeah. and he's just as big as Ortega. Just you know, Frank Edgar, you know, talking about his future. Maybe a graphic came up saying that he had the most in in octagon fight time in UFC history. And I tweeted at the time when that happens, you know, someone's near the end. There's not long to go with him as a top contender. Yeah, Max Holloway is nowhere near that. You know, he's 
coming into his prime now. He, I know he's still young, but he has a lot of uh, a lot of experience and and a lot of fights in it. And he's you know he's in his prime. He's in the top of his career now. And he's you know Ortega's coming towards that as well. He's still young in his career, but uh, I think that's maybe just the difference from Holloway. Ortega is improving all the time, but I, I'd have to uh, I'd have to favor Holloway just. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm kind of with you, Sean. I'm favoring Holloway, but I love I love Ortega and this organic sort of journey that he's had to the title shot. The fact that he sort of jumped in late notice and fought Frankie Edgar. And it, it, it's sort of a world where a lot of fighters are very hesitant to jump on these opportunities and jump in last minute. And, oh, you know, and we didn't have a full camp and we're not in the greatest shape. Well, Ortega kind of reminds us that these opportunities really do pay off if you jump in and you believe in your skill set and you are ready to go. I mean, this has really pushed him up there. So mm. it'll be super exciting to see this fight with Frankie and it's, Edgar. It's, just, I mean, just quickly, it's not bad for a guy who we all thought was going to miss weight at UFC 214. Do you remember that, Dennis, when we're all sitting there at the early weigh-ins and everyone's looking at each other like, Jesus Christ, where's Brian Ortega? And then he comes in there in the very last second. I think he said that he, he slept in or something. Uh, but by the way, MMA media, we get really grumpy when someone makes us sit there to the very last <laughs> minute to weigh in and there's no controversy surrounding it whatsoever. Every, everybody everybody weighs in in 30 minutes and then one guy we have to wait an hour and a half for. That's always fun. There's always one guy. There's always people. It's like a, the locker room in a police station. There's always people walking around, <laughs> talking trash, having a coffee, chewing some gum, looking around. People Shooting guns. Behind. Shooting guns. People whispering, oh, look, he's in the back and he's like three. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah, they come and make perfect weight. <laughs> and then I w- waltz over to Ariel Hawani. Oh, Ariel, great weather today. So that Brian Otega, uh, he, he's uh, maybe three pounds over now. So uh, it's just, it's one of those, it's really hilarious. But anyway, with Frankie Edgar, um, he's a fighter's fighter. He's a guy that is, has had an unbelievable career. He's kind of more of a bridesmaid than the bride for a lot of times. But I mean, this guy is an ex-champion. So he, he's he's achieved a lot in his career. If he, if he retired tomorrow, he would definitely be one of the, I don't know, one of the sort of biggest legends that they've had in, in these divisions. The wins that he's got, the fact that he's been able to stay so relevant at 36. But when it comes to what's next for him, it'd be a tough thing for me to pick. I mean, I don't know. Jeremy Stevens came off that, you know, sort of controversial win. Do you get them to rematch again and sort of let Stevens show if he's got what it takes and if he beats Edgar, it kind of gives him more credibility to go up the ladder. I don't know. But for the time being, I have to say, just the fact that Edgar still took this fight and didn't wait around for Holloway to be, you know, to be better and do this fight later on, it just shows the kind of heart that this guy has, especially the fact that he's 36 years old and he knew, you know, in the back of his mind, if he loses this fight, this severely derails everything. Also, with Conor McGregor talking about this possible fight and blah, 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 you'd think, oh, there's a big money fight here if I win as well. Who knows what's going to happen? So... Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen next for Edgar. What about you, Sean? Do you have any ideas as to what you'd like to see him do next? Um, I don't know because 135 pounds is is the kind of the move you'll be thinking about next because he's lost twice to to Aldo and he's lost this this fight now. And you mm. know, if if he had fought Holloway and lost, he would have lost more title fights in a row than anyone in UFC history. And he's wow. you know he's already drawing that uh, now with four losses in a row. So does he need a new lease of life? 135 would be that but then you have to look at Frank Yeager as well and you know I, I mentioned that Ortega was brilliant on Saturday night but Frank Yeager definitely slowed down he's not as fast as he used to be you're talking about going down against 35ers who are going to be lightning quick is Frank Yeager you know is he going to be able to change his game to play maybe a big man game where he was always the kind of the small man who was a faster person before that's going to be a bit tough so maybe Federway is is the best uh, is the best place for him you know as you mentioned there Jeremy Stevens could be one you know there's a lot of guys around. Josh Emmett just come off of a loss. I'm sure Josh Emmett would love to fight Frank Yeager, uh, but there's you know there's a lot of guys around there. So I to be honest, I'd love to see Frank Yeager retire. As you mentioned there, he's you know a legend of the sport, uh, a great fighter, fought for so many titles, won the won the title. He's nothing left to prove to anyone. You know mm. it's it's he's going he you know if he keep, keeps going, I know he he get a lot more wins. He could get back towards the title shot, but is he going to win a title again? Like are, which is more likely, him winning a, a title again or him getting and three or four more knockouts in his career if he goes on another ten fights, mm. like mm. I'd probably say the knockout. So it, it, you know, it's I'm not calling for Frank Edgar to retire or anything, but it's I think it's something we need to see more in the sport. It'd be great to see someone come to his age who's done everything he, you know, you'd want to do in the sport to, to bow out at this stage and save themselves from more injury. 
Yeah, it's I, you know, it's almost like chasing the dragon. You get a little bit of taste of, uh, I guess, success, and then you feel like you can keep going. But you're right. Like even if he does win a few fights, I would never count out Frank Edgar. That'd be stupid. But it is hard to see him beating, you know, Ortega in a rematch or Max Holloway or whoever is champion at the time. But I, look, I definitely think he can work his way back up to a title shot because if you look at the division, like you have Ortega, and then afterwards you don't really have any other clear contenders. Like I, I'm, you know, I don't think they're going to be doing Jose Darren Aldo Elkins. anytime. Beg your pardon. My boy Darren Elkins. Darren, Justice see, for Darren Elkins. Darren Elkins. See, that's another name that I was kind of floating around. I mean, you could potentially do Elkins versus Edgar, and that's that's a huge opportunity for Elkins, even if it's maybe not really fair, because Elkins is on obviously a huge streak, whereas Edgar lost. But you know, if 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 Edgar beats Elkins, he's back in the mix. If Elkins beats him, bam, you've got a Brian Ortega situation. You've got sort of a new contender. You could also do Korean Zombie as well. Korean Zombie and Frankie Edgar, those are two veterans. Korean Zombie is obviously a tough test for anyone, but maybe it's a it's a bit of a, a a softer test. Even though Korean Zombie is a big man, it's a softer test for Frankie Edgar to sort of come back from another guy who um you know did have a, a bit of a layoff and then came back, got the win against Bermudez. I, I think that regardless. Frankie Edgar's going to get that title shot sooner or later, as long as he keeps winning one or two more fights, because they don't really have too many other options. So that's that's what I'm foreseeing. I think it'll be Dominic Cruz. I oh, reckon he'll fight Dominic up? Cruz next. Yeah, I think he'll move down, yeah. No, I think Frankie will move down to 135 and fight Cruz. Okay. That'd be a good fight mm-hmm. right there. That'd be fascinating. That would be good. But then, uh, what's the deal with him, Sean, and his weight? Do you think at his age that might destroy his body a bit moving down, or do you think he should be all right? To do I think he, I, I think he could make it pretty easily, to be honest. But do, you know, does he want to? He, he'd have to cost. You know, he's probably. Uh, so who, someone said recently he walks around around one forty seven or one forty nine or something like that. Wow. After obviously, well, he was walking around bigger at one fifty five. But since he's come down, he's a guy who doesn't like to cut weight at all. And you know, I'm a big advocate of not cutting weight. But you know, I think he could make it in in the realms of the way a lot of other guys make it. You know, and, and be maybe have a bit of a size advantage. So you know, mm-hmm. everyone is everyone he's camping on and himself. I believe in the past has, has said he could make it pretty easily. So you know, if they're saying that, uh, I'd I'd uh, I kind of trust them on that. Well, there you go. Well, that's the next logical step. Then there you go, Sean. You've you've just destroyed all our theories with a <laughs> brilliant theory of your own. But I will say this: you did mention it. The retirement thing. There's that moment. Every fan has, we've all we've all had it where you see one of your favorite fighters fight and you see them noticeably slow down in that fight. And that's always mm-hmm. a very, very sad moment. So at 36 mm-hmm. years old and him relying a lot on the fact that he's got good speed, good footwork, a lot of the a lot of the gifts that he has are technical, but also a lot of them are, are physical. I just hate for him to go down like a BJ Penn route where we're watching a shadow of his former self, even if he's still picking up victories. And I guess he's a little bit of a Stefan Struve in the fact that he's worked his way back to so many title shots and in, in his hearts of hearts, he knows he could do it again. So he's on that dragon Casper. But anyway, let's mm-hmm. talk about the main event because Chris Cyborg got a big win over Yana over the weekend. Of course, the, uh, the win was predicted by many of us. We believed that this would happen. But what happened afterwards... A bit controversial because uh, Raquel Pennington was supposed to fight Amanda Nunes at UFC 224, it looked like. And after Cyborg wins this fight, Dana White begins talking about a potential Cyborg Amanda Nunes fight. Sean, what did you think of this? And what was your reaction when you heard Dana talk about this? I was delighted. This is the fight to make. It has to be made now. Amanda Nunes is the only person to fight Chris Cyborg. I literally... I can't think of anyone else who I who I want to see Chris Cyborg. There's nobody. And why would you risk losing the only fight for Chris Cyborg by having a Man United fight Raquel Pennington? With all due respect to Raquel Pennington, you know, she's a good fighter now. I think she deserves a title shot. I, I, you know, I'd say to her, sit out for six months, wait for that fight. You, you're getting your title shot after that. Mm. But this fight needs to be made now. It's it's the time to make it right now. Uh, and, you know, it's a great fight. It's... Probably the most high level fight in women's MMA history. I say make it, you know, do it, do it in Brazil, do it in International Fight Week, but they have to do it. They really, really have to do it. Yeah, I, I don't think it's that bad, especially when you consider how long Raquel Pennington's been on the sidelines, which is really unfortunate because obviously there was a lot of steam behind her after she beat Misha Tate at UFC 205. Not only beat her, but retired her. And then later on, you hear about how she had all sorts of crazy injuries into that fight, which made it even more impressive. But, you know, I think there's kind of... I don't think this is egregious at all because there's got to be a spectrum of how long we wait or, or, or how much... Um, 
I guess it's not about credit, but like Brian Ortega, for example, he beat Frankie Edgar, right? He's all the rage right now. We're talking about him as the, the next logical contender, right? But if he waited out for, let's say, a year and a half, hypothetically, I'm sure we wouldn't have that same attitude. I, I'm sure if somebody else got a title shot instead of Brian after waiting out for that long, we wouldn't be like, well, that's just outrageous. That's ridiculous. And I think it's sort of a similar situation. Raquel has been out for a long time, and I think it almost benefits her in some ways that this fight's being made... <clears throat> relatively quickly and so if cyborg can have another quick turnaround afterwards i mean it's a different story if they were going to do it in say july or you know later on in the year then pennington could be sitting out for quite a while but it's pretty quick it's around the corner if they do it then and if amanda nunez beats cyborg and then raquel pennington fights that version of amanda nunez that's great. And to be honest with you, even even though she's obviously earned a shot, I wouldn't even be opposed to seeing Raquel Pennington get somebody in the meantime, just purely, I don't know if she wants to do that, but I kind of feel like she might just to sort of get rid of that cage rust, just to sort of get herself, you know, a little bit back in the swing of things. So I don't, I don't think it's really a bad situation for Pennington. I don't think she really loses out at all. And like you mentioned, Sean, if she wants that title shot, she really does want it immediately. She can definitely still have it. But Curious what you guys think as far as if Chris does beat Amanda Nunes, what does it do to the bantamweight division? Does it sort of, I guess, discredit their champion? Because, I mean, personally, I'm sort of of the opinion that when you move up in weight, it's like a free pass. If Amanda goes up there and loses to Cyborg, I don't think she really loses much because, to be honest, everybody loses to Cyborg. And we all know she'll be fighting above her natural weight. Any theories on this, Sean? Nobody's ready for Cyborg. It's like Asuka, you know, that streak is not it's not stopping anytime soon. I don't think it discredits it at all, no. Um, I think it's a bigger chance, as you mentioned there. You know, if she loses, she'll just go back down to it. Cyborg's too big, you know, she's one of the best ever. But if she wins, I think if Amanda Nunes does, goes up, does go up, um, it, it gives her a big chance to, to, you know, make herself the biggest fighter in women's MMA history. And, and you know, to knock off Cyborg would be absolutely huge. And, you know, if she goes back down, I don't think, as you mentioned, I don't think anyone uh, will, will really care about it. I don't think it'll discredit the division or anything. It, it gives her more hope than anything or more of a, you know, more of a chance to just to become a huge fighter really and uh, if she can beat cyborg she becomes one of the best uh, one of the best women's MMA fighters of do, all time so yeah she, i think do you think she kind of needs this because the thing with amanda nunes is she obviously beat misha tate you know that was great then she beat ronda rousey so she's almost like randy orton she's like the legend killer retiring people left mm-hmm. right and center mm-hmm. and you would think that that would translate to pay-per-view buys but it hasn't and then her and shevchenko that didn't draw well and now they're throwing i mean when you think about the people that Amanda Nunes has fought, Jesus Christ, like, she is getting no easy fights. And understandably so, she's the champion, she shouldn't. But, like, Ronda Rousey, Misha Tate, Shevchenko, that's a really tough fight. And now going to Cyborg, man, she's been put through the, the you know, the gauntlet. But th- this could be what she needs. I mean, if, if anything's going to make her a pay-per-view draw, this has got to be it, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, it could help, but I don't think anything will make a difference. To be honest, I, 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 I think you either are a pay for pay per view draw, you aren't, or you go in that direction, and that's where you reach. I, I don't think she's getting there, even though she's been on, you know, UFC two hundred, and I know it's because it's UFC two hundred, but that did huge numbers, and Brock and all was on that, and a lot of people saw her. But you know, she, I, I think a lot of it is just clicking these days. You know, you have to be a great fighter, and but you have to be a great talker and a peep. A uh, person people want to see as well, you know. You've, you have to be an influencer. I hate that fucking word, but that's what you kind of have to be these days to uh, for people to tune in to see you and to be a big pay per view draw. And is Amanda Nunes that? No, I don't think she is, and I don't think uh, I don't think she ever will be, to be honest. But you know, it, Cyborg is is kind of that a little bit, and she is kind of there's just kind of three echelons in MMA these days with McGregor and well, maybe maybe four with McGregor and then maybe Jones and. And, and GSP kind of after him, and then there's kind of Cyborg, and then there's kind of everyone else. I think Cyborg's a little bit of head, a little bit of head of the Woodleys and the the, the Demetriuses and stuff in, in terms of a draw. And maybe if if Nunes did uh, beat her, she could take that mantle. But I don't think she's going beyond that, to be honest. Mm-hmm. It will be interesting to see what happens there. Let's quickly talk about Conor McGregor. You mentioned him just before. It's been an interesting few weeks with Conor McGregor. I mean, he's been on social media really sort of focusing on this whole Frankie Edgar thing, mentioning how he wanted to save the pay-per-view for UFC 222. Also talked about, uh, you know, always going back and forth with Max Holloway. There's a bit of a Twitter war going on there. It looks like he's really kind of focused on the division as of late, Sean. So 
I'm just curious, what is your take on what's going on here? Is it the fact that he's sort of out of the limelight and he wants to be spoken about again? Is he just bored because, you know, he's living this millionaire lifestyle and he kind of misses being back in the mix? Or does he want to sort of remind people that he's still the best guy in the division? Where do you think he's coming from with all this? I think he's coming back and I think he's preparing himself for his next big fight. He wants to come back and, and wants to take a big fight. The, the flight talk seems to have gone away totally and it doesn't feel, seem like that's going to happen again. And I'm not sure if, the, you know, I, I still think the GSP fight will happen next uh, for him, but I'm not, you know, it doesn't, at the moment, it doesn't GSP's really seem like that. Though, cause that could say, it doesn't look mm. like GSP's coming back anytime soon. Yeah, he'll be back. <laughs> yeah, <that's> the, <laughs> You're not falling <laughs> short, GSP. No, I'm not, I'm not falling for that. No, if, if it makes dollars, it makes sense. I said so often, you know, the cheddar make it better, as Rampage Jackson said. <laughs> yep. it, 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 it will. And he said he was on MMR, I believe, on uh, on Monday and said that he he didn't say straight out he'd fight again, but he kind of hinted that he probably will fight again. So What I love um, about that interview was he basically said he didn't want to fight anyone, except for kind of Conor McGregor because it made money, but he still was like, eh, not really McGregor. But it was just like a real through everyone at him and he's like yeah Ben Askren maybe if he has one or two fights in the UFC I'll fight him it's like <laughs> Nick Diaz oh I definitely won't fight Nick Diaz Nay no, Diaz nah I don't think I'll fight Nate no, Diaz Woodley nah I don't think I'll fight Woodley and I love how he just spoke about his legacy in so much detail and what these fights could do for his legacy like it really shows you this guy is so focused on the legacy and like really considers what every fight would do for him like for, for him McGregor makes money but he doesn't think it does much for his legacy it's kind of funny. I don't know. Yeah, I'd say I, I the legacy is all the that obvious he... names of who you'd fight, <laughs> yeah. and he's he's not really like that interested in any of them. But he's kind of like, look, if if something interests me, I'll come back. It's like if none of those guys interest you, I don't know who's gonna come back. Maybe fight Stipe because that's a good fight for your legacy. If you can beat Stipe, Michael Bisping rematch. Michael Bisping rematch. Yeah, <laughs> but I love, I love how he was. It was at one point he was talking Floyd, about he, yes. doesn't, he doesn't know like what division he's gonna come back to, and he's like, I don't know, 185, 170, 150. It's like one eighty five. Didn't you almost die at 185? Like, how could you be considering this? And after everything that happened, how is anyone going to let GSP fight at 185, much less for the title? I don't know. That was that was pretty insane. Yeah. Yeah, look, I think it'll probably be McGregor. Like, his legacy's set now. What, what, what's he going to do now to change his legacy? You know, he already came back and won that middleweight title. If he goes down and, and beats Woodley... You know, that'll be great. That'll be great. But I, you know, he's already he's beaten a lot of better guys in their time anyway than Woodley. I know Woodley's probably better at the moment than all of them, or uh, you know, as a as a, an A to B mixed martial artist or whatever. But I, I don't think it really makes much of a difference if he does fight McGregor and has that huge fight. You know, that two million pay per view by fight. I think that does pl- plenty for his legacy and plenty for his bank account as well. So I think that you know that really makes sense. But for McGregor, uh, it. You know, him calling out the likes, of, or maybe not calling out, but, you know, saying stuff about Max Holloway, saying stuff about Frankie well, Edgar. Do you think he uh, actually wanted to save the paper of the UFC 2? Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you 100%. think this was a legit? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it definitely was. Yeah, I know, you know, McGregor does, doesn't really do that sort of thing without it being true. You know, he says a lot of other stuff and, you know, he he's, he's not a adverse to hyperbole, but he has... You know, he's talked about coming in for short notice fights before. You know, he's he has taken guys in short notice. You know, he accepted a fight with Frankie Edgar before on short notice, but when they rang up Frank Edgar, he was injured, obviously, and, and he couldn't take the fight. And what it was an ATS one, wasn't it? I think it was, yeah. Or, or was it uh, Mendes? No, it wasn't. I think it was. I can't remember. But yeah, you know, he. But it he, wouldn't have been a feather. There's no way that would have been a forty. No, no, no. Hundred, hundred percent. And not. I, I was, was just thinking of the weight, yeah. just making the weight on short notice, right? Yeah, that no, would be. Would, yeah, wouldn't that have would been be ridiculous weight. against Edgar, right? No. It, you know, but a lot of people are talking about it being a 165 pound title fight, which I don't know where that kind of came from. I don't know. <laughs> Did McGregor say that? But like, it would have made more sense to have McGregor defend his title, and I know it would. That that's more than likely the reason why they didn't do it because this Habib Ferguson thing is coming up and um, <laughs> like it's so weird that Conor McGregor said he'd fight last Saturday and Dana White confirmed that he said he'd fight last Saturday and now in three weeks time or whenever it is they're stripping McGregor of his belt and giving it to someone else mm. like I find that very odd like if he's mm. ready to fight why don't just give him a you know give him and, a fight and, and didn't Dana White say odd. something along the lines of like he likes to become champion but not defend his titles 
Mm, and then yeah. this kind of happens. That's interesting just because very... when, when you hear Diana speak, he's always very careful, and you can always see that respect that he has for McGregor. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, this is the first time where he's really, maybe since 200, that whole fiasco, where he's really, truly sort of thrown McGregor under bu- under the bus. I found that interesting. It's all a negotiation tactic at this point. Yeah, it, it's all negotiations. Because McGregor is just... not 100% back yet. Like, it's, if, if the money is right, he'll come back. But he's in no rush to come back. You know, he's probably 150 million in the bank, all told. And, you know, Burger King pay well these days, I hear. And you know, he's, <laughs> it's, it, he's no reason to come back. Dana White needs him more than he needs Dana White, to be honest. But I, I think he does want to come back. And that's why he's starting all this to, to make, you know, t- to build it up and to make it even bigger when he does come back, to make people want to see the fights. And, you know, they definitely do want to see him fight all those guys. And I'm interested because uh, UFC 222 really kind of focused um, social media on Frankie and Max. With UFC 223 coming up, I want to see what kind of effort he's going to go to to really sort of getting the mix with Ferguson and Khabib. I know there's always a little bit of trash talk here and there, but I want to see what kind of extent he's going to go to. But just quickly, GSP out of the equation, guys. Just want to quickly get your thoughts. If you could see McGregor come back to fight one of the following gentlemen, Holloway, Ortega, Khabib, or Ferguson, who's your pick? I, I want to go with Khabib. Sean? Khabib, yeah. Oh, whoever, well, whoever wins out of Khabib and Ferguson, that's the next fight to make. But I'll tell you what, Conor versus Khabib in Russia, we've spoken many times about how I don't think that'll ever happen just because of, obviously, you know, the pay-per-view and the time difference and all those kinds of issues. Uh, but my God, Khabib versus Conor in, in Russia. A man uh, in do it in Iran, Ireland. Right? Do, do it in, in Ireland. Ireland. The mine Russia, yeah. Well, <laughs> Russia. I mean, sure, yeah, that, that'd be great. But again, time difference, pay-per-view, yeah, unlikely yeah, to happen. Yeah. Do, you, do you think he'll Sean, have a can fight? we stay at your house? Do you have a spare room? What's going <laughs> no on? No problem. I'm, I'm three and a half hours from Dublin, though, so that's the only problem. If they have it in Limerick, yeah, but, we have it in Tommen Park, we'll put it on there. That's all right. You can just drive us around. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> we will, I'm kidding. We, will, we, a... we won't mind. That's okay, Sean. Do you, th- do, you have, think, have... do you think he'll ever fight Holloway? Because he's of it, like this is this is you know other than Khabib or Ferguson, this is a matchup that you know tickles my pickle very much these days. Him versus Holloway <laughs> in a rematch, uh, but you know the, I just I find it hard to see McGregor ever wow. coming back to forty five, unless maybe it's his last fight ever, and he just wants to remind people, you know what, I'm still the featherweight champ. Do you think that ever happens, or maybe not? It could happen because if McGregor does come back and fights regularly, maybe twice a year. He's gonna have to find those big fights because you know he could fight GSP, definitely could fight Nate, he could fight uh, Habib. They're all huge fights. But then you know you're struggling. Maybe you need to find another one. Obviously, someone will definitely pop up. But if he's the lightweight champion, if if Holloway is the featherweight champion, you know it, that makes sense to 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 have a big super fight. So I could definitely see it happening. But I I wouldn't say you know I don't think it'll happen to be honest. But I I could see it happen. But McGregor beat him already once and he, you know he did beat him and obviously it's a very different Max Holloway we could talk about that for half an hour but in his mind he that's kind of a road already travelled I think even though it's, uh, you know I've totally Max Holloway was a child now compared to he was and look McGregor was as well we, you know we could talk about that but it, I, I just from Conor McGregor's kind of mindset like he's always about making you know traveling new ground making new records going you know doing everything bigger and better and i think in his mind he probably said i already beat max all the way why would i want to do it again so yeah for that reason i think yeah, maybe not I, I just envision um victorian government articles coming out of the newspaper will conor <laughs> mcgregor fight in australia i will say though just quickly before we jump uh, quickly to luke rockhold and let you go sean because it's late there at night and you know you have things you have to do more important than this um the WWE did confirm they're going to be coming down in october and doing a show i believe at mcg in melbourne wow that's like a hundred thousand people yeah. that's that's going to be a huge huge show so i'm curious how they're even going to do that because me and casper went to the one in 2002 global warning and that was, uh, they were supposed to have Hulk Hogan on there, and there was Brock Lesnar, um, The Rock, Triple H, all in the main event with Hulk Hogan that was supposed to be there. They sold it out, 56,000. I think they said the record there, but 100,000, and especially with the talent that they have now, maybe like Ronda Rousey is going to rematch Holly Holm or something in a WWE gonna be ring. A, I don't know what's going to happen, what, but it's going to have to be What pay-per-view is it going to be? Well, they're not sure. They're going to do two stadium international shows, and it could be like a straight-to-WWE network. Thing. They might not even be doing a pay-per-view. So the whole thing's a little bit silly. I'm not sure what's yeah. going on, but they just announced it. So anyway, yeah. anyone out there in Australia, maybe, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. I, I don't they'll know they'll what's be giving away happen. tickets at the Lesnar front door if they want 100,000 people there, like free tickets. Well, you, well, Brock Lesnar would, you'd think Brock Lesnar would have to be on that. Sorry, yeah. all the pro wrestling people, just a second. Um, <laughs> all the MMA people, just a second. Sorry, we're going to go back to Luke Rockhold and Michael Bisping in just a moment. But I was wondering Rockhold... where you were going with that. I was like, Luke Rockhold and WWE? He's like, fuck it. Well, they never know. You know, the guy's doing no. ads. 
Let's do it. Why not? You know, okay, let's just quick. And you guys to Australia a lot. He's fought here a few times. It would be just natural to have him come out Beautiful here and, and well. lose in a WWE ring. No, I'm kidding. He'd win. Okay, so <laughs> let's quickly talk about Luke Rockhold's <laughs> trilogy fight. Yeah, and he's actually a friend of Shay's. He's a good guy. Um, quickly, his trilogy <laughs> fight with Michael Bisping. <laughs> Luke, please come back. His trilogy <laughs> fight with Michael Bisping is in discussions um, with the UFC. Guys, is this the perfect way for Bisping to go out after Luke losing in Perth? Do you think it kind of matches things out a little bit? Sean, I'll go with you first. God, no. Why, why would Michael Bisping want to get knocked out again in his last fight? Oh, God, I think it's awful. I know he knocked him out the last time, but... That was kind of from nowhere. I don't think that's happened again. Although Luke Rockhold has, you know, his chin is obviously a big problem. But I, I you know, if that they fight, if they fight ten times, I think Rockhold probably wins eight, eight or nine of those. Uh, that's and I don't know why I said that, but that's weird. But I think he does. I think he's he's a better fighter than Michael Bisping. You know, I always thought Bisping Vitor was the fight to make, but obviously Vitor's fighting Machida now. It's hard to know. You know, what does Michael Bisping really want this? You know, the London card is gone now. It's well, it's in two weeks' time, and he's, so he's not going to be on that. Uh, um, and I don't, I don't know if they're going to bring a car to Manchester. You know, they're obviously coming to Dublin, uh, reportedly in the twenty seventh of May, a, a great day for it. But uh, God, who's, you know, who's he going to fight? Where is he going to fight? Where does it make sense? You know, the Luke Rockhold thing, you know, it makes sense because it's the trilogy and all that. But for, you know, you ask me, does it make sense for Michael Bisping? I, I, I don't think it does. You know, I think you're, if I'm Michael Bisping, I'm leaving that where it is, where the last thing to happen in a cage between me and Luke Rockhold is Luke Rockhold having to be woken up from the floor by Big John McCarthy like so yeah I don't think it does make sense but for Luke Rockhold it would make great sense it would be a great way to get him back you know in, in the in the win column I think it's I think Bisping's quite crazy for winning that fight because like you mentioned it, that was the biggest win of his career you could I mean mm-hmm. maybe some people would argue Anderson Silva but obviously Luke Rockhold was far more in his prime than Anderson Silva was when Michael beat him and that was obviously the night that Michael Bisping put on the you know the, the cherry on top to his career and he won the titles I just don't understand how he can a top that performance or or what he really has to win from that but if that fight gets matched up I think that shows a lot about Michael Bisping and I guess his confidence because while the rest of the world and a lot of people may see that as a fluke victory obviously Michael Bisping doesn't believe that for a second and I also find it interesting because he spoke about how he didn't want the VTOL fight because he doesn't want to be seen as an asshole. There's so much trash talking, and there's a lot of that side to Michael Bisping. He obviously sells fights a lot, but he's also, you know, he's he's also a very nice guy. I think he enjoys the trash talk, but I think he also wants the crowd on his side. And he spoke about how for his last fight, he just wants to go out there. He wants to enjoy it, and he doesn't want to be remembered as an asshole. Uh, but if you know, if, if he fights Luke Rockhold, <laughs> that. there's going to be a lot of there's a lot of uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of trash talk. It's going to be trash talk left, right, and center. I will say, though, Michael Bisping will probably get a lot of cheers because the public, you know, sometimes they're not really too keen on Luke Rockhold, so maybe he sees it as that. But, you know, there's still a chance for people to remember him as a bit of an asshole if, if the trash talk gets out of hand, which it absolutely 100% no doubt will. The only thing I see is that if, if uh, and you know, he's not going to be headlining a pay-per-view with this, uh, so I don't see him getting any pay-per-view points or necessarily a whole lot of extra money, but it does have a big fight feel at least. Like Bisping versus Machida, fine matchup, fine contest, not really a big fight. Bisping versus Rashad doesn't excite me, doesn't get me out of my chair. Bisping and Rockhold, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm somewhat excited about this one. What do you think, Dennis? Yeah, it'll be funny if they do it in Australia as well. It's like, bring it back to Australia. Michael Bisping and Luke Rockhold always fight here. He's, Luke Rock, Rock, Rockhold started. pretty much has an apartment on the beach in Perth by now. So apparently mm. he's friends with a lot of the guys at the surf club and likes to have tinnies with them. So mm. it makes sense from that perspective. And I think if you're Luke Rockhold, you're also like, hey, hell yeah, this is a fight that I want. You know, get a little bit get a little momentum going, Michael Bisping. This whole thing that we've had going on will make me a bit of money. So if you're Luke Rockhold, this is great. If Michael Bisping, maybe not so great, but... Who knows? Maybe he's up for the challenge. We'll have to wait and see. But, guys, that is the end of the program. A big thank you to Sean Sheehan. Of course, you can check him out on Twitter at Sean Sheehan, BA Severe MMA. The show to listen to after you're listening to finish listening to this a lot more classic gold over there, his useless fact of the day. Not so useless, but is a fact. Make sure you check it out. There's a lot of funny ones that he does. And just quickly, a big thanks to our guests, Randy Couture, Michael Chiesa, Valentina Shevchenko. We will be back next week, same time, same place, unless all our guests pull out. Tell them not to pull out. (laughs) Tell them to come on to Submission Radio. We love having you guys. It's great to be back. We'll catch you next week.